Hello, I want to welcome you all to the launch of Race and Modern Architecture. I'm Mabel O. Wilson, the Nancy and George Erup Professor of Architecture Planning and Preservation here at Columbia University. I'm sitting on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledge, acknowledging the Native American communities where you are, their elders, past and present, as well as future generations. We must acknowledge that our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land Columbia University is located. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I also want to extend a special welcome to the students, faculty, and Dean Robert Shibley of the University of Buffalo, and the students, faculty, and Dean Keith Crumweedy of California College of the Arts, CCA, who have joined us in co-hosting today's book launch. I now want to invite GSEP Dean Amal Andreas, who will say a few words. Thank you, Mabel. And hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to Race and Modern Architecture, a critical history from the Enlightenment to the present. We're here to talk and celebrate the launch of the much awaited book by the same name, published this past July by the University of Pittsburgh Press. The book sold out just three weeks into the hardcover first printing, which is an incredible feat and a really great accolade for the publication. I hope you all have the chance to read it soon, if you haven't already. I want, of course, to thank Mabel Wilson, Irene Chang, and Charles Davis as co-editors and contributors and who've organized this today, and want to welcome all of the incredible contributors and speakers. Today follows the symposium that took place in Wood Auditorium in 2016. Four years later, on the eve of the next US election, it offers us an occasion to reflect on all that has happened. Out of unbelievable pain, trauma, and upheaval, have emerged overwhelming and heartening calls for social and environmental justice, for racial and gender equity, for black lives to matter, for undoing systemic racism across institutions and for urgent change and action. For our own disciplines and practices, I would say that our meeting today and this conversation we are about to hear is probably the most crucial reflection we must engage in. It is necessary that we reread the foundations of what we know or we think we know from fundamentally altered perspectives, retracing the erased, rendering once hidden violence visible, giving voice to the unheard and unrepresented, and redrawing the lines and shades that were undone. I have no doubt that today's conversation and our ongoing commitment to unlearn whiteness will enable new foundations from which to think, imagine, and practice differently, more equitably, but also with more joy. So thank you again for joining, and I'm now really thrilled to turn it over to Mabel Wilson. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Amal, for that, that generous introduction. And uh, my co-editors and I realized this collection would not be possible without the patience and guidance of our editors at UPIT Press, Abby Collier, and the wonderfully generous staff at the press who produced the gorgeous hardcover and paperback editions of the book. We owe a special thanks to our contributor, our fourth editor, Diane Harris, for her counsel and her gracious invitation to join the roster of her book series, Culture, Politics, and the Built Environment at U Pitt Press. Today's event will not be possible, would not be possible without Lila Catalier, the Director of Events and Programs, along with the AV staff here at GSAP. So thank you. So Race and Modern Architecture, or as we refer to it, the Race and Modern Architecture Project, began to take shape in 2013 through a series of conversations between me, Irene Chang, and Charles Davis about how to excavate the latent discourses, representations, and histories of race and racial thinking and modern architecture. To do this, we needed to find interlocutors. For our call for contributors, we wrote that, quote, the Race and Modern Architecture Project seeks to uncover how racial thinking influenced some of the foundational concepts of modern architecture and urban theory, including the primitive hut, ornament, national style, organicism, modernism, regionalism, postmodernism, and the digital, end quote. And it's the digital we didn't quite get to in the volume, so we'll leave that. 
for, for, for other, other scholars. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So in February 2016, we convened a two-day workshop at GSAP with 15 other scholars from inside and outside the field, from institutions around the world, to collectively think through critical questions and methods for how to write race into architectural history. And we want to thank them, that group of scholars uh, who have joined, who graciously joined us today. We also hosted, which is what you're seeing here in the uh, image, a panel open to the public. Uh, it was called Critical Dialogues on Race and Modern Architecture, where scholars from the group joined in conversation with our colleague and MacArthur Award winner, Saidiya Hartman. Could I have the next slide, please? So each of the 18 essays in the collection responded to our original, or responded to our original charge to discern, quote, how has the racial been deployed to organize and conceptualize the spaces of modernity from the individual building to the city, to the nation, to the planet, end quote. This question could not be more timely in this moment of racial reckoning. So my co-editors, Irene Cheng and Charles Davis will now provide an overview of race and modern architecture. Hi everyone, thank you Mabel, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, well, it would be impossible to summarize um, the contents of the book, and we hope that the panels that follow will give a sense of the rich and nuanced arguments um, and case studies in the volume. But for now, I'll offer just two overarching points that the book tries to make. Um, can I get the next slide, please? First, Race and Modern Architecture argues that race is a topic that's central to the discipline. Um, indeed, to the founding definitions of what it means to be modern. By race, we mean a concept of human difference that classifies people into distinct biological groups with supposedly innate and unequal characteristics. It's a system of thought that be, beginning in the 16th century becomes deployed to justify hierarchies of power and domination throughout the world. Um, in other words, race becomes a critical concept enabling the development of slavery, empire, and capitalism. And if we understand modernity as the product of the entanglements of slavery, empire, and capitalism, then it's also imperative to understand how modern architecture as a cultural and intellectual project emerge out of ideas about racial hierarchy and racial others. There could be no modern architecture without identifying other building traditions as non-modern uh, or vernacular or primitive. Um, and we couldn't have ideas about progress, freedom, order, and rationalism, all of these core tenets of modernism, without a concept of some other peoples or other cultures as being atavistic, unfree, disorderly, and lacking in reason. Understanding how ideas about race inform these key concepts is essential to unlearning the whiteness of our discipline, a task that's now more urgent than ever. Bannister Fletcher's Tree of Architecture, which you see on the screen here, offers a vivid and familiar illustration of the racial ideas embedded in um, the canon of architectural history. Fletcher's book, which was first published in 1896, became, with its 1901 fourth edition, one of the earliest, uh, quote unquote, global histories of architecture. And its frontispiece depicted the history of architecture as an organic process of development in the form of this tree that flowers and grows from historic styles rooted in a number of determinate um, cultural conditions to the modern styles at the top. But if you look closely at this diagram, you find that the highest branches are all European styles and that this European or Western tradition is depicted as a kind of solid main trunk while the lower boughs of Chinese, Indian, Peruvian, and Mexican architecture, or what uh, Fletcher calls the non-historical styles, are represented as these truncated branches. They're literally dead ends that don't develop any further. Sub-Saharan African architecture is not represented at all. And what we show in the book is how Fletcher's classification system, which is ostensibly about cultures and styles, is informed by and parallels a large body of earlier architectural theory that identified styles with races of people and that drew explicitly on 19th century racial science. <clears throat> 
And in fact, you find echoes of this kind of racial typological thinking in architectural textbooks, even in the late 20th century. Um, this image was reprinted in many subsequent editions of Fletcher. Um, so it reminds us that race has been there all along. It's a, it's a concept that's been prominent and present in the canon, but we haven't always addressed it or given it its due. A second point I want to mention about the book as a whole is that we see it as uh, a kind of first step rather than uh, a concluding one. So when we began this project five or six years ago, there were far fewer scholars working on the topic of race and architecture than there are today. Um, since then, we've seen a steady stream of books and articles that address this subject. And so we recognize that things are evolving and we're very interested in the work, um, the future work that this book and books like it inspire. And so related to that, we've created a website, uh, www.raceandmodernarchitecture.com, where we'll be adding um, new short essays and reflections, and we invite contributions um, from others. Uh, Charles, um, uh, has a, Charles Davis has a piece on the website about settler colonialism and uh, US architecture, and I've written an essay with some reflections about the violence of racial images um, that's related to my own chapter in the book and some second thoughts that I had after the book came out. So we hope that this work will continue. We hope this is just a kind of launching point in many senses. And next, Charles will describe some other related initiatives that have emerged over the summer. Thank you, Irene. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so there's been a couple of things that have been happening so far since the launch or the uh, publication of the book um, that would help to give you some context, further context, as well as to understand uh, some of the initiatives that we're involved with to contribute to what's becoming uh, known within the field now as uh, an initiative towards an anti-racist architectural pedagogy. One of which is uh, what you see here in this slide, the Global Architectural History Teaching Collaborative um, enabled us to conduct a workshop on creating syllabi for an anti-racist uh, pedagogy. Uh, entitled, as you can see here, Can We Teach an Anti-Racist Architectural History? I would like to thank um, Anna Maria Leon uh, for helping us to uh, formulate that package and to get that put together, as well as uh, Jiegu and Anna Ozaki for helping us both to co-organize this event, as well as to um, formalize the toolkit that's available. So if you look on uh, their website and you take a look at uh, the resources available, one of those resources as a result of this workshop, both thinking through case studies and sharing sample syllabi and workshopping them, is a toolkit that will help you to think about how to reformulate your own um, syllabi or parts, other parts of your curriculum towards an anti-racist perspective. Another thing that we were engaged in was uh, a kind of uh, interview and overview of the book with the Society of Architectural Historians through their programming uh, called SAH Connects. And we'd like to thank Patricia Morton for both uh, hosting and moderating that particular session. Can we look at the next slide, please? So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book and the volume in a slightly different way. Um, instead of just uh, reviewing what the contents are or uh, going uh, deeply into what each chapter has provided, we want our contributors to think through some of the ways that we can think on what avenues have been opened up by their work in this publication and by the publication collectively for the field at large. Uh, in the first half of the day, we will be looking at uh, the questions that deal with uh, people's personal uh, uh, contributions and personal investments in the work. Um, so the first question that we were asking them to contemplate is what were the methodological and archival challenges in writing the book? And then how was the book impacted or how has the book impacted your work? Then for the second half of the day, after a short break, we're going to ask them to think about the ways that this volume has helped them to rethink what is possible within our field. How do conversations of race affect the ways you teach the architectural survey? And what new lines of inquiry does the book open up? Can we see the next slide? So uh, just to give you a sense of the structure of the day, and I don't want to belabor this too much, uh, but we're in the uh, introduction and welcome phase at 3 o'clock. 3.15, we're going to look at our first panel, 
uh, which we'll talk about methodological and archival challenges. And at 3.35, we'll uh, segue into our second panel, the input of the book, the impact of the book on your scholarship, after which we'll have a discussion. And this discussion will collect all of the contributors that are here today so that we can talk about these first two questions uh, and interspersed within this, we'll entertain questions from the audience as well. After a short break, we'll go into our second half. And if we can get the next slide. Uh, 4.30, we'll have a, a Dean's Welcome by Dean Robert Shibley from the University of Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning. And then we'll go into panel three, which will discuss teaching the architectural survey and changes that uh, one might make based on this work, as well as new lines of inquiry that have been opened up by this scholarship collectively. And then we'll have a closing discussion uh, with all of our panelists, including questions from the audience. And then finally, a closing uh, from Dean Keith Promide from the California College of Arts Architecture Division. So I want to just uh, briefly then uh, segue us into the first uh, panel. Um, and if we can look at the next slide, what were the methodological and archival challenges in writing the book? So in advancing this collection, we reached out to people who could innovate the study of history, primarily through either recovering understudy topics or by looking at traditional points of view through a new critical lens. This required them to intervene uh, and to develop um, new types of critical lenses and or to uh, discover and to struggle with the types of archives that they were using. And so I want um, to sort of hand this over now to the three people who are going to be presenting here. Uh, and they're going to talk to both their specific chapters and the challenges they had uh, in this aspect. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, yeah, Charles. Okay, thanks, thanks for very much for that. Um, my name is Mark Crinson. Um, if we could have uh, the slide that I've got. Thank you. Okay, so this slide uh, looks like it's a kind of uh, just been crammed together. I've just crammed together as many pictures as I could from the chapter. But in actual fact, for me, it exemplifies problems of method and also, I think, um, their solution. My chapter in the book was on colonial Kenya during the so-called Mau Mau emergency in the 1950s. And I tried to connect the spaces produced by British response to revolt, the new villages, with the white highlands of colonial settlers, with new government buildings, with the issue of legitimacy of property as discussed by Gikuyu thinkers like Kenyatta and Ngugi, with modernist buildings in Nairobi, particularly houses, idealist plans for multiracial harmony by an um, AA student in London, and the new politics of race relations in Britain. Now, we recognize that there are huge differences between these spaces, the spaces represented by these pictures. And Franz Fanon calls these differences compartmentalized worlds. For some time, uh, architectural historians have tried to look across these these compartmentalized worlds, to show agents traversing them, to show the old center periphery as more complex, as more contrapuntal, or as more about differences than, than hierarchies, alternatives than hierarchies. But what we've ignored or found difficult to do is embodied in this slide. Not just that there are things that seem to continue as normal, even in this situation, the situation of colonial crisis and the ways architecture makes crisis livable as much as coercion possible within the colonial habitus. But that architectural history has hardwired into itself a range of 
subfields and disciplinary protocols and competences that also divide the field, denying the simultaneous time of the whole environment. So what's the solution? Well, to bring out the connecting tissue, the dialectical differentiation of the whole. For Kenya, that was a racialized and a psychologized relation to land and landscape. Spatial psychologies like liminal conditions, alienation, isolation, displacement were understood as having racial equivalents. If this was overt and overtly contested on one side of this, of this compartmentalized uh, world, our method equally needs to bring out its hidden but connecting logic on the other side. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Charles. The short answer to your prompt involves the word gossip, or more precisely, the validity of gossip as evidence for architectural history writing. Next slide, please. There were no treasure troves of primary documents detailing how two possible ex-slaves of African descent erected a Lagosian mosque that drew upon construction skills they got in Brazil, and a visual memory of architectural forms from England, Lagos, and Brazil. Yes, their names, Porfirio and Martin, were mentioned in the Lagos Weekly Record and the Sierra Leone Weekly News, as was Mohammed Shitta, the mosque's financier, you see on your right-hand side. To date, no invoices of construction materials have been unearthed, no bills of laden, nor do we presently have photographs of Porfirio and Martin. That is where the well of information according to one approach dries up, or so some may think. For while there has been a considerable move within the academy recently to accept a diverse array of methods within architectural history writing. In practice, however, Lila, next slide, please. Methods privileging data of patrons and architects in print, architectural drawings one can hold, and textual information about clients and the society at large seem to still dominate the evidence of architectural history, or at least have an upper hand when considered in tandem with more transient data. Which brings me back to my inner turmoil with the value of gossip. The genesis of this book chapter lies in a discovery of the odd whisper that Brazilians settled in Lagos and created architecture that captured the splendor of the world they left behind in Brazil, even if they had no access to such a world. That whisper was recorded in one Nigerian popular journal of art and culture without any footnotes. Yet that motivated me to interview old Lagosian residents who said, yes, Joao Batista da Costa, Lazaro Borges da Silva, and even Francisco Nobre built this tomb and that mosque, and so on and so forth. Slavery stripped many ex-slaves of birth certificates and diaries that may enable an historian to construct the history of their person or even their architecture. The presence of centuries old oral histories in Southwest Nigeria made the later introduction of the National Archive a curious idea. Histories had always been oral, embodied, even, I might add, architectural histories. To this day, each palace in Southwest Nigeria, and there are several, has a song of the origin of the kingdom where the structure is found. Many kings in the region have used such songs to reconstruct their palaces. In 1825, one palace was rebuilt using its song, 
after the original building was destroyed by Fulani invaders from present day Northern Nigeria. Architecture in the 19th century was part of a matrix of words and structure. Hence, my discovery of palace song traditions changed my view of the value of gossip about Afro-Brazilian masons. One can debate about the possible difference between gossip and oral history. Individuals are commissioned to do the latter and are known for their remarkable memories. Yet orality in the region is inseparable from architecture. The methodological challenge I faced led to this change in thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adedoyin. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Charles, organizers, other organizers, um, and all the contributors to this exciting uh, and important book. Um, present company excluded many current efforts to critique and dismantle the white supremacies of the architectural field, conjugate as the work of recognizing architects who, or projects that, identify as specifically black. The first methodological challenge of my essay was producing anti-racist knowledge about architecture and urbanism that opted out of this body and building count. First slide. Thank you. I wanted instead to explore what Mario Gooden has described as black spatial praxis the manner in which Blacks occupy and move through space, negotiate spatial relationships, and create alternative spaces for creative expression and daily affirmation of life in the afterlife of transatlantic slavery. These are multiple micro operations worth considering so that we might know or how to know or know how to know, other pleasures, struggles, and powers besides a Black project by a Black architect. The second challenge of my essay was contesting a still vigorous narrative about the residual progressivism and or full-blown democratizing force of architectural modernism at mid-century. Like other counter histories of the modern movement and its trajectories, my reading of Noah Purifoy's collaborative artistic and curatorial practice in the late 1960s tracked his rejection of a design vocabulary that has nourished specific racial identities and opportunities, functioning not only as aesthetic violence against minoritized people who disidentified with the conventions of white bourgeois heteropatriarchy, but also as an exercise of biopower flexed through the unit of the population and along lines of difference that negated the life chances of those people, which in this case were residents of the Watts neighborhood on the eastern edge of South Central Los Angeles. A third challenge was studying Purifoy's work in a way that centered his own methodology of assemblage. Purifoy searched for and assembled discarded objects and materials much of it sourced from the wreckage of the Watts Rebellion in 1965, into sculptural compositions and group exhibitions. The work was not to mourn, glorify, or otherwise fetishize the wreckage, approaches that would continue a pattern of conflating the neighborhood and its residents with junk. Instead, Purifoy and his collaborators put the junk into mutable relationships with the bodies that interacted with them and the built and unbuilt environment of Watts. Staging these relational assemblages was a process of seeing things, including blackness as a disposable thing, otherwise. For Purifoy, this generative assemblage mode, what I call junk modernism, produced uncertain results, and by the early 1970s, diminishing returns, as indicated by the bleak title of his 1971 show at the Brockman Gallery. For me, as a historian and critic of color who is not Black and only recently American, following Purifoy's practice confirmed 
a need to write more interdisciplinary accounts of the built environment in the US that discharge from the anti-blackness of Western European humanism and its legacies. Thank you. Okay, so we will continue um, next with our second panel um, and continue with this focus on um, uh, individual scholars um, work and uh, recognizing that it's been five years since we started this project, as we alluded to in the beginning, um, we wanted to ask a few of our contributors to discuss how um, working on the book and uh, race and modern architecture project as a whole had impacted um, their scholarship. Um, and so next we'll have Brian McLaren, Addison Godell, and Kenny Coopers. Um, and I also wanted to mention that following this panel, we'll have about 20 minutes for discussion and questions. And so if you'd like to ask a question, you can um, enter it into the Q&A um, in Zoom. Thanks. So first, uh, I'd like to say thanks to Irene, Charles, and Mabel, as well as to my colleagues who are part of the February 2016 Conference and Book Project. Uh, I suspect my response to this question is largely similar to most. Uh, the combination of the event, um, various submissions and feedback on those submissions and the refinement of the arguments in that process created an extremely positive space for scholarship to be shared and to develop. Uh, I've learned a lot from my colleagues and their work and as a result have been able to advance a piece of scholarship. Um, but of course, uh, there's more to it than that. To be a bit more specific about my own work in this volume, um, the conference and book project um, allowed me to test out um, and develop one part of a larger book project that's currently in press. Um, this larger project uh, looks at the relationship between modern architecture, empire, and race in fascist Italy. Um, can I have the first slide? So the chapter that I wrote examines a single architectural project, uh, the design competition for the Edifici delle Forze Armate at the Esposizione Universale di Roma. Uh, over the course of an extended trajectory uh, from a design competition, and next slide. Uh, to design refinement and its eventual partial execution before the construction was interrupted by World War II. Uh, my interest uh, was and is in seeing how the way that architecture and the arts were judged and executed during this time could be seen as a kind of proxy for the racial climate in Ital Italian politics and society where ideas of racial purity were paramount. Thus, a genic process of seeking purity in architectural expression. Now again, this is just one of several uh, directions that I took in the book project. Um, I guess as a final comment, and I was just reading um, the chapter and then thinking about what I've been writing since then, uh, as a sign that scholarship has always in flux some aspects of what I wrote, has been further developed. Uh, and I certainly would have reached the point of my current research without this opportunity. Uh, and maybe a do-over might, <laughs> might be possible. But in the end, I guess, just like the, the work that I examined, I'm interested in, in terms of scholarship, um, the development of an idea over an extended period of time uh, for me is interesting. And it's not even this chapter or even the work that I have produced after, but it's a continuing impact that I think is significant. Um, and again, I wanna say thanks for that opportunity. Hi, um, so also thanks to everyone. Thanks to Dean Andros, thanks to Lila Octelier, thanks to SUNY Buffalo, GSAP, CCA. Mabel, Charles, Irene, thank you for this opportunity and your support throughout the process. And congratulations on the publication of this fantastic book, which I'm already seeing 
uh, change the conversation in our field. Um, next slide, please. My chapter focuses briefly, uh, looks at the figure of the Chinese garden in European thought, uh, starting with the work of the Enlightenment architect Fischer von Erlach, who didn't know much about Chinese design, but assumed it must descend from the same universal rational basis he imagines for Europe. Um, knowing little about Beijing, he assumed it must resemble Solomon's temple. Knowing even less about Chinese gardens, he assumed they reflected the same advanced engineering he'd heard about in Chinese bridges. So this reflects ideas of human variety as opposed to race. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a few years later, we have William Chambers, the British author and chinoiserie architect, and now the gardens are, in his writings, emblems not of reason, but of sensuality, uh, with thrill rides, flames, uh, electric shocks, and concubines, also wrong, um, but comporting with 19th century racial theory, which confines non-white races to the material world, um, and his illustrations emphasize physiognomic difference. And, so it's not surprising that by the end of the century, the most famous Chinese garden in the world was burned down by British and French soldiers who thought it represented an indolent and unchanging people, reflecting a Hegelian worldview in which white cultures progressed through time and non-white cultures were frozen. So uh, I track these garden episodes against philosophical texts and argue that chinoiserie is a racial theory, a racial praxis. How this has impacted my work, um, number one, for the next panel, it has already impacted my teaching at Pratt. Our sophomore survey course under the leadership of Meredith Tenhor is already using several texts from the book as we work to build an anti-racist syllabus. The students are responding. It's very uh, exciting right now. Number two, uh, thinking and writing. This essay came out of Mabel's seminar at GSAP, where we examined theories of human variety and racial science. And Mabel, as I recall, basically said, just see what happens if you take this lens and re-examine a canonical topic. Well, there's tons of chinoiserie scholarship, but reading it specifically through race, I found this new story, and it was a really live, enjoyable process that the first version of this essay was the easiest time I've had writing something in uh, years. And that leads to number three, which is the prompt to keep doing that, uh, to see the book as a, a beginning. Um, since the development of systemically racist narratives and uh, institutions was fundamental to modernity, virtually any topic in modern architectural history could and should be reevaluated in this light as we see throughout the book. I'm working now on my final dissertation chapter, um, knock wood that my archives reopen soon, on uh, sewage treatment architecture in post-war Manhattan, which has been recognized in histories of citizen participation and of environmental racism, as these facilities were overwhelmingly cited in communities where people of color live. What I'm noticing now is how much the architects assume design can assuage community reaction by being contextual. Uh, for example, in a set of 1990s sludge dewatering plants where communities were told, uh, okay, this one fits into an existing art deco facility. This one by the ocean looks like uh, beach cabanas uh, and so on. So uh, my question right now is, can we read architectural contextualism, this postmodern trope, as a strategy to assert colorblind conditions where every community wins, um, thus, thus masking unresolved racial injustice in urban space. This is an unfinished thought, but I'm challenging myself to really think it through in this chapter, uh, and that's where I am right now. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Mabel, Irene, and Charles, uh, also for me, for including me in this uh, very important conversation and for the collaboration in this project over the past years. The project for me has been key to shifting the analytical focus uh, from nationhood and style to the ways in which architecture shapes racialized relationships between land and people. 
Can I have the next slide? Architectural historians, but also cultural and political historians uh, of Germany have long studied empire as being Germany's uh, European territorial container rather than an unstable project fundamentally shaped by colonial violence and racialized dispossession, uh, both overseas and uh, on the European continent. And this has meant that in the vast and otherwise very sophisticated body of scholarship on, on German modernism, the Deutsche Werkbund and the Bauhaus, imperialism is often reduced to issues of economic policy and international geopolitics, and therefore race uh, and the body has been largely absent as an analytical category. So in my chapter, and I, I should admit this chapter is somewhat transitional, uh, feeding uh, into a book manuscript that I'm completing now and that would look quite different. Um, but in this, in this chapter, I focus on how architects, planners, reformers, and engineers, uh, a lot of them in uh, imperial and colonial administrations, employed architecture to construct discursive and material relationships between people and land. And these relationships were persistently racialized. And they ranged from post-enlightenment distinctions between so-called civilized and natural peoples, as was uh, suggested before, but also in the, in the case of Germany, oppositions between Teutonic uh, tribes and purportedly Black Poles. And so in these racial constructions, it was farmhouse architecture that served as an effective means to bolster arguments of legitimate occupation, because it suggested in this case, a timeless and almost natural relationship between a racialized group of individuals and a particular area of land, a region or a territory. And so I was interested in studying how this farmhouse architecture was used in different ways in Germany's multiple colonial projects, both overseas and within Europe. So on the left, you see an image illustrating how in Namibia, once Germany's prime premier settler colony, Architecture was used for prisons and other public and private buildings to organize a population along strictly segregated lines. In this case, white uh, and also Cape, uh, Cape Colony settlers against Africans who after the German uh, genocide were being turned into a landless proletariat. And an image on the right, which shows how in Eastern Prussia, a vast experimental terrain of what was called internal colonization Similar architectural forms became part of an industrialized logistical system of construction. And this system served to build a racially defined German villages that would replace centuries of Polish presence in these parts of Central Europe. So in both uh, cases, architecture served uh, to construct racialized relations, and these were key to overseas colonial occupation as much as they were to imperial modernization and modernism at home. So I, I still uh, get quite a bit of pushback uh, for using the term modernism to describe uh, projects that look uh, like the, the ones on the images. But I would argue that this resistance uh, can be seen as part of a persistent uh, reproduction of a racist worldview in uh, still much of our scholarship, one that sees color in so-called vernacular architecture and does not see whiteness in modern architecture. So if we look beyond the folksy style of these buildings, uh, I suggest we can begin placing race and coloniality more at the center of modernism. And I have to say, this is very much uh, the beginning of a project uh, for my thinking for which the book and the collaborations and the, the um, uh, contributions to the volume have been uh, very fruitful. So I thank you for that. Great, so thank you guys for um, answering our prompts and getting us started on a conversation about this um, first half uh, of the program, which asks uh, speakers to think individually about uh, some of the methodological challenges that they specifically had or the transformation of their work um, as uh, they were uh, doing the project. Um, just a couple of points to uh, emphasize again before opening up to all of you to, to um, think about this question aloud, because I think actually there are probably others who might have also faced methodological issues or uh, introduced key critical lenses that um, folks um, may not have uh, heard uh, in other areas of research or, or have even anticipated. But 
Uh, a couple of things that, to me that were really quite interesting. Um, at the Doyen, you spoke about um, the role of taking uh, alternative archives seriously, particularly when people will dismiss them as either gossip or oral history. So it's interesting uh, from my perspective to think about the many types of stories in communities of color that tend to be dismissed in that way, um, whether it's sort of um, overseas in the global south or even uh, sort of in North American context, the ways that um, the musings of people of color as non-professionals um, uh, is dismissed in this way. And it makes me think of what uh, Lisa Rudin also uh, discussed in those terms as trying to find a lens that is not sort of the, the patronizing lens of um, typical black social uplift or inclusion within a field, but to take the work seriously on its own terms uh, by taking on a lens that was appropriate for these uh, communities of color. So from my perspective, I, I really appreciated those lenses as sort of uh, revisionist lenses for uh, the ways that um, uh, folks were, were thinking about their projects and, and moving in. Um, uh, I, I, there are many other things to say. I don't want to sort of uh, take up the floor, but as, a, as we're looking over the Q&A that's coming in, I wanted to give uh, all of our contributors an opportunity perhaps to chime in about um, some of the, the musings that they have on methods and archives that they have come across, um, as well as um, uh, the, the second issue of how the work may have evolved or shifted uh, over the long course of time from the RMAP workshop itself to the book publication and now as it's out here, as we're looking at uh, things across uh, the field in a different way, different contexts. Charles, I'll, I'll start. Okay. Um, just to, to build off of your, um, sharp observation about not just formulating new critical lenses for these um, archival traces, whether they're official archives or um, disparaged archives, but to think about those lenses in ways that are appropriate to the objects or, or the questions that we might have. And um, for me, this has been a, a sort of a case of um, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in our volume, our collective volume, the recent modern architecture volume for its, um, its, its uh, project of unlearning whiteness. Um, but at the same time, I think there's also um, the opportunity here to learn other modes, other racial modes of uh, power and inquiry and identity and formulation broadly. So for me, it's about learning blackness um, and, and thinking about how, how does one unlearn whiteness and learn blackness as, as a response to the whiteness of modern architecture, um, not in a way that, um, you know, to be overdetermined about ghettoizes uh, the question or makes it um, seem um, extraneous or in the re register of gossip or song, but that is constitutive of um, the narratives that we're trying to um, critically interrogate. And so, um, yeah, thinking about the critical lenses as, um, as lenses that are uh, appropriate, true, responsive, uh, attuned. Um, and this is, this is why I keep doing this with my hand to indicate sort of the granular, the micro mode, the sort of, and, and the almost the, the, the palpable and, and uh, uh, um, embodied sort of registers with which that, um, that method ha ought to be pursued, I think, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, maybe um, I can um, say a few words about oral history that you mentioned. Um, and my essay is actually on the 1980s, and that's why I could actually speak to the uh, people and the uh, residents uh, of a public housing project uh, that were in uh, that that are living there, which are the people of color. So, um, obviously, uh, the more historical distance there is uh, between the topic that we study uh, and our time, the less oral history chances we will have. 
So I think uh, building on what you said about the importance of oral history in making up an archive, I think um, one can also um, support the projects that um, collect oral histories now before it gets too late. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't mean to um, only pin the conversation on oral histories. <laughs> That's keeping people from speaking. So for example, Addison, um, I really liked your comment about how it is that we are um, developing alternative subjectivities about what it is that we're looking at. And uh, you gave yourself a, an opportunity to just look at traditional topics through a, another lens. And I think that that's definitely a, a major prompt of the volume itself to get us to rethink modern architecture. What it is that we think we know about that particular discourse? Um, but to look at it anew through the lens of um, different types of uh, uh, rubrics, critical race theory, or, or some of the others that, that have been introduced. Um, and I think that that's actually, um, as at least um, in the conversation that I've had with folks about how it is that they're being impacted by the book, um, that is inviting them to do this kind of thinking. Or, as opposed to telling them precisely how to look at the, the discourse. Uh, and um, when we had the workshop um, in February, many years ago now it seems, um, I, I thought that that was what was so um, wonderful about the perspective from the, the many different chapters, that uh, there, it, was, it was really an invitation to start to think through things that I thought that I knew in one way, but from a different perspective, whether it's a a marginalized subjectivity that we now center back into the work or even just a sense of revisiting the familiar. Um, so your, your suggestion to look at postmodernism again, which I know some designers are doing now and some people sort of um, sigh with exasperation of, of doing, but if you can give them a way to do it in a way that's interesting, I think uh, is, is the, the usefulness of it. So I, I really appreciate your comments for doing that. It, thanks. And I, I actually, now that you say that, I realized something about the, um, my, my paper in the book, which is that uh, the this, this subject matter of Fischer von Erlach, uh, it, it's literally some of the first stuff I learned in architectural history class when I went to get my MR at, at Ohio State, where Jacqueline Gargas gives a fantastic uh, survey um, and, and delves into some you know, characters like Fischer, who maybe are not always in uh, these syllabi, but you know, it's probably, I don't know, two months into architecture school, and you know, here's Fischer von Erlach, and sort of filed him away in my brain, hadn't thought about him in a while, and uh, the, the prompt to kind of revisit something that's that's a thing that popped back out. So, you know, it might even be an interesting discipline to say, uh, you know, apply the book or apply some of the lessons of, of the, the book to the, the earliest thing you can remember learning in when you learned architecture or some of, some of the first lectures that you got um, and, and just see what that, what that does. I wanted to ask a question. Um, actually, um, building on a remark that Kenny made um, about working on um, the architecture of imperialism um, but finding that you could work on the architecture of imperialism, but in a way where race is still kind of omitted, um, which I thought was interesting because that in a way is surprising. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, Addison, some of the material that you look at, it's about sort of in Orientalism and imperialism, but also in a way that it's been written about in the past in a way that does maybe highlights those concepts, but not race in particular, or Brian, um, you know, looking at fascist architecture, but that also you know, um, has, hasn't always spotlighted race, ironically, even though it seems like it would be obvious. Um, and I was thinking about this because I was reading an old article, um, a, a great article assemblage by um, Golsim uh, Nelbantoglu about um, Fletcher's Tree of Architecture. And it's all, you know, it's all about reading the image through a post-colonial lens, um, but it doesn't mention race once. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm sort of just curious if you can talk a little bit more about that um, and, and how this might, you know, represent a kind of shift in, in our, our methods and in the discipline. Yeah, so uh, perhaps very briefly, um, scholarship on the Deutsche Werkbund, of which there is a great deal 
um, usually treats uh, empire as a kind of static territorial container um, with um, shaped by, let's say, economic policies uh, of Weltpolitik or geopolitics. Um, and I think through that lens then uh, by, um, I guess, sticking to metropolitan archives, it would be possible to avoid race. But yes, it is curious. Yeah, I would say maybe in the case of the Italian work from the late fascist period, um, there's a couple of things. First of all, attempts by scholars to make distinguish, distinguishing relationships between Germany and Italy, which are generally actually not that accurate um, to say that you know, the Italians um, were not overtly, you know, the racial um, ideals were, were there for political purposes. But uh, in fact, uh, when you start to research, you realize um, it was a lot more serious than people have accounted for. I think the challenge in terms of architecture is, is to make an indirect connection. Like the, the connection is not one of a direct analogy or a di direct, you know, a particular style or a particular approach, but one where you have to um, understand, and that's where the methodological questions come in, um, trying to understand how race uh, was mapped onto contemporary projects at that time without necessarily an obvious sort of stylistic uh, reference. And I think that's the challenge in doing it. And I think that most scholars um, writing about it have you know, acknowledged that you know, writing from that period um, have tended to look at certain kinds of work as it dismissively, uh, they were modern, so they didn't have any political allegiances or they were uh, you know, monumental fascist buildings that, um, or an expression of power, and that the truth part of the analysis is somewhere in between that. That it, it's not fruitful to make those kind of distinctions between a particular stylistic approach to architecture and a particular um, belief. And so it, it requires a more indirect approach than you typically would do with other kinds of projects. But I, but I do think the point, which I think is interesting, both between Kinney and and, and Brian, and uh, particularly, you know, this kind of period of modernism, you know, where whiteness is never marked, you know, the work that race does, particularly in relationship to politics, right? I mean, um, epistemically and ontologically, right? The work that the concept of race does, which is to characterize modern subjectivity, is many would argue first and foremost a political one, um, like of the citizen, of the liberal individual, right? And so there's a way in which whiteness immediately becomes transparent and invisible because it is the category of citizen just autom auto automatically, right? And I think as Kenny, you suggest the vernacular then becomes marked, right? As the place of color, the folk, um, you know, the, the person on the, the other side of the border. Um, and the racial construct also just does a certain amount of work in capitalism as well, but I do think, um, you know, within the category of, of, of the political um, is one way in which its invisibility becomes operable. So well, we're getting quite a few questions sort of populating in the question box. I'm going to ask a few of them. Um, and some are pointed directly to certain um, uh, contributors. Uh, here's one that was asked specifically of Adet Doyen um, by Lawrence Chua. Um, it's written, I was struck by Adet Doyen's invocation of gossip as modality of historical expression and the way subaltern scholars have applied similar approaches to excavating silences from official archives. Can you speak to how other disciplines have enriched your own methodologies in excavating race from conventional histories of modern architecture? Um, Lawrence, thank you very much for the question. Um, um, this is really sort of the start of um, a project in terms of uh, thinking of where uh, my scholarship goes from here. But, to sort of answer your question, it, it reminds me, so um, there was a particular king, um, he's, he's linked now, but um, he um, used um, oral history to 
um, reconstruct his own palace. And I was struck by the fact that um, he participated in drumming and dance in order to uh, be very intimate with, um, you know, the oral history of his palace. And so the short answer to your question, Lawrence, is, um, you know, uh, certain fields like dance performance, for instance, as well as, you know, uh, musical traditions, um, music, in other words, are um, certain fields that, you know, um, I point to that have enriched, um, you know, this project going forward. So um, that's what I can say. Again, it's, you know, I'm really at the start of this, but um, to even conceive of the fact that an architectural historian would um, have recourse to fields like music or dance, for instance, in order to uh, go about architectural scholarship, I think is radical. And there's another question from um, Pamela Karimi. Um, one of the problems with the scholarship of non-Western architectural history is that unless it relates to the canon, it is not taken seriously. For example, if Le Corbusier happened to work in some non-Western place, there is so much interest to know about that part of the world in relationship to Corbusier's project. But if scholars write about a given non-Western region by focusing on regional and local experts, unknown to the architectural history canon, these scholars fail to attract attention. How to resolve this problem? Do regions in which Western or colonial architects did not work deserve any attention? And I guess this is a, a question generally about the weight of canons and the inertia of that, that um, tradition of learning on how it is that we understand modern architecture as a kind of uh, rubric and what can we do to revise that understanding or is there a sense that these non-traditional subjects have uh, a space for, for folks. Um, yeah, I, I think one response to the question could be to point to the, the current version of Bannister Fletcher, which I think was published last year or the beginning of this year, um, which made a conscious um, attempt to, as it were, represent the world um, by filling in the gaps, by, in a sense, bringing everything to the surface, by making the canon extend across every aspect, every region, every country. And of course, one can, one can do that kind of job, but that is a project you know, a project of continually bringing up to the level of continually researching the, that which hasn't been researched so far, of continually bringing buildings that have not been considered so far into the, into the picture. But I think it's also a problematic um, approach because um, it, um, assumes that there is some kind of state. And of course, it's a, it's a function of a positivist approach to scholarship that we're constantly filling in the gaps or renewing or updating. And that at some point in the future, we will reach some stage of completion in which we can sit back somehow and understand the world as a completed scholarly project. Yeah, I mean, I would just add maybe to, to Mark's comment, and I, I was just thinking about your presentation, to some degree is that question of what we don't know is also kind of the logics of colonialism, right? It's like the, the, the logic of engulfment, globality, um, you know, the sort of penetration into the spheres of, 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 of the unknown. Um, and sort of there is a logic, and some would argue that the Western episteme in general is so tied to a kind of colonialist mentality, of which architecture is, is also embedded in. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it, it goes back to um, what Audre Lorde would say, you know, will the master's tools be able to dismantle the master's house? Maybe I would like to push back a little bit. Um, and I do agree with Pamela's question, and I think it's a very important question that we need to address, uh, and we need to address self-critically. Um, I mean, I know this is a very celebrated 
celebration of the book and I'm, um, you know, I, I congratulate us all for this book and so on, but maybe in a less self-congratulatory note, I think I would like to recognize how long some of this work has been actually going on uh, in the field, uh, but has been trivialized and dismissed or has been done. I mean, not maybe in these with the same concepts, but uh, the intention uh, and with other concepts and it has been done by people who have been denied tenure or publication. Um, and so, I mean, I remember uh, myself uh, starting to work on these topics and 15, 20 years ago, it was a very difficult, very oppressive time, um, both in architectural schools and in institutions and in SAH and so on. And I assume that the people, the scholars before me had even a harder time. Uh, so I think the progress has been slow and there are many erasures that are happening along the way. So I, uh, I would, for that reason, um, um, also, uh, I mean, would like to actually acknowledge uh, the people who have been doing this uh, stuff, but uh, who have been dismissed and uh, extending Fletcher's book uh, by adding more uh, non-Western quote unquote topics into it and trying to have a comprehensive account is not the only way of studying non-Western architecture, is not the only way of writing history. So we need, I mean, if Fletcher's inclusivity uh, is, has all its problems, as uh, Mark uh, has raised, uh, we still need to look for other methods and people have been doing this. So I just wanted to um, say that I do hear Pamela's question and it is a continuing problem that we need to address. I agree with that. I was just thinking that um, sometimes we, we pit this as a kind of either or um, either the practice is one of unlearning whiteness and critiquing the canon um, or um, learning blackness or, you know, articulating um, uh, non-white or minoritized or subaltern um, traditions and kind of, you know, inserting that into the story. Um, so I, I think it's possible to say that it's that we need both, um, that both parts are important. I, and I thank you for sort of calling attention to the fact that you know, many of these issues have been worked on by scholars in the past. You know, in a way, there is a, a sense sometimes of kind of, um, we, reach, we as a discipline sort of return to these topics like every 20 years. And it's sort of, you know, there's an intervention and then it gets pushed to the side and then another generation has to kind of bring it up again. Um, so I, th I think that's an important dynamic to recognize. I think there's also the, um the necessity to acknowledge um, the specificities of institutional context that um, at least in, uh, in curating this volume and talking to people about its contents, I find a lot of architectural historians um, very eager and hungry for this kind of conversation. And uh, for those who have been having it previously, have been having it amongst themselves, doing it in isolation or within their small uh, cadres of of fellow writers, um, and, and that um, presenting something like this in this kind of collective format, not only for architectural historians, but for practicing architects, people in professional architectural schools, um, who tend to think about architectural history in, in a very different way, and when challenged in a, in a way that's sort of compelling and inviting for them to rethink uh, things like the canon that they're given, or the the traditional, very traditional kinds of precedents that they tend to get uh, from designers who are not involved in this conversation. Um, I think it, it's, um, I've seen it to be very enlightening in that sense. So uh, for me, I, I think that um, while of course there, ha there are always precedents in how literatures are made and um, there are ways that certain fields are in advance of other fields or even other parts of the discipline. If we talk about architecture from the side of practice versus the side of history. I think there's an interesting kind of um, point of convergence and inflection now with the questions that practitioners are forced to ask themselves because of the political moment that we're in and the kind of advances and innovations that historians have been making for some time. And that this moment, uh, of course, we're, we're probably doomed to repeat it in 20 years. But what will we be talking about then? And what kind of advances will we have made since then? I think 
uh, there's there are some opportunities here that that we can definitely take advantage of. And but from my perspective, I think the bringing together of all these voices that's what I see as the kind of productivity and that the eyes that are likely to look at this volume versus some of the other scholarship because of where it was or because of where it was marginalized and ghettoized. Um, I think uh, it is a kind of uh, advance. I'm hoping that there's a kind of advance in that. Let me just jump in there also. Sorry, Mabel. Um, um, as you're talking, it's making me think um, of the divide that exists in our discipline um, institutionally and organizationally between um, what you might call high architectural history and vernacular architecture. Um, and certainly there's a very rich um, body of scholarship on what is called vernacular architecture. And I think one of the challenges of this book and the larger project is to make us rethink that divide. And um, I would love to see an interrogation of the, of the term vernacular. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And actually uh, a comment just came into the Q and A um, sort of raising this issue of kind of revaluing um, the vernacular um, as a way of sort of reinserting race into um, the kind of discipline. Um, so I think, I think others are sort of having similar um, responses. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, maybe, or are we out of time, Mabel? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say, can Mark actually, because Mark actually does talk about the vernacular in his essay in the book which I thought was a really, I had not thought about that term, but actually there's a really, um, yeah, lovely way in which you sort of contextualize the sort of racial dimension of the term vernacular. Well, um, the term, you know, derives from the Latin verni, which means uh, um, the, the, the domestic slave. It means the kind of slaves that the Romans had serving them within their, their household. And so, you know, it, it's a term that, that immediately is based, is premised upon the difference between master and slave. And so whenever we, in a sense, carrying that, that forward, whenever we, we call something vernacular, we imply that something else is, you know, presumably is the master, uh, presumably is the, you know, the, 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 the vernacular is placed in, in a situation of kind of otherness and opposition to something which is more powerful than it, uh, more expressive than it, that, that can speak, that can, you know, use the language, uh, whether that be of, of building, of architecture, or of culture more widely. And so I think that it's crucial, actually, um, to when we study, when we study race, when, especially when we study race within within colonial situations, that we bridge across, you know, the, 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 the distinctions that our discipline has made between the vernacular and the high, um, the modern and the non-modern. I think that's, that, that's really, you know, to me that, that is the kind of method, it is a way of asking a question, how can I bridge across between these things, how can I link these things together or bring out um, the things which link them, but which have been denied by their almost embedded, they, the way in which the discipline has embedded their differences, yeah, their distances. All right, we have time for one more question um, before the break. Um, and so, this one gets back a little bit to the question asked by Lawrence about um, interdisciplinarity. Uh, Manuel Schwarzberg Cario asks, um, was wondering what the focus on race and modern architecture could do for scholarship beyond the traditional confines of architectural history itself. What other fields should it draw from and reciprocally potentially modify? What can this architectural history do to or with or against fields like history, urban studies, sociology, planning, etc.? Can I respond to that? Maybe with another question. Um, and I'd like to go back to where Mabel started actually with a wonderful um, call for awareness of the native lands that uh, many of our institutions are on. And also the question of method, because I'm, I'm being um, very much pushed by my students um, in urban studies to, to think about 
um, how to decolonize the very institutions that we're part of um, and to think about ways in which the epistemic inequalities that shape our disciplines and that shape um, racial inequalities, how we might not just um, theorize those or study those, but also actively work to dismantle. And I, I think urban studies has done much better in that regard than architectural history has. It has thought about the relationship between researcher and researched, about the audience that our work um, addresses, and also about the community with which we construct other kinds of knowledge. And for me, this is very much a kind of a new terrain and certainly not one um, I, I am, I am uh, very comfortable in yet. But I, th I think that would be one uh, thing for architectural historians to address and to think beyond um, the fact that method is about oral history or something like that, but rather that these are, are epistemological and political questions. I, I might offer something by way of um, art history and visual culture studies insofar as I, I don't institutionally identify it um, as an architectural historian at least. Um, and we might want to reverse building on, on um, Kenny's response, the, the very, the original question, right? It's not in as much as the question might be what can race and modern architecture do for other forms of inquiry or do to other disciplines, there's much to learn from other disciplines and interdisciplines um, in, in um, continuing the work of, of a kind of critical engagement with this intersection of race and, and, and architecture. And I'm thinking specifically of cultural studies. We just flagged the 1990s and 80s as a kind of, uh, the kind of cyclical nature in which the question of, of um, of, of race and the episteme and academia um, 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 manifests, and I would think that cultural studies is a is a is a body of knowledge that, um, while may seem dated, uh, literally, um, still has much to offer for, uh, particularly around conceptualizing and theorizing race um, and space too, actually. Um, and so, critical geography, I think, is another discipline that has much to bring an interdiscipline, and I would argue um, much to bring to the debates here and the question. Um, uh, visual culture studies uh, or visual studies uh, in its interrogation of uh, the role of vision and visuality and visual, uh, visual praxis um, seems important, not just uh, as a kind of object of interrogation in the built environment, but also a methodology and to sort of interrogate, you know, how we are using archives and where we are situated as looking subjects, researching subjects in the process. So there are many, there are many other disciplines that I think have um, a lot to give to this inquiry and build um, in collaboration with, with, this, with this project, with this disciplinary specific project. Any last comments on this question? I don't know if Diane um, is somebody who draws a lot on um, sort of cultural studies and whiteness studies in your own work, um, whether you want to address it, or Adrian Brown, who is also um, coming from, I think, a, a, from a, a discipline outside of architecture. Um, if you guys want to weigh in, please feel free. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I have anything really fo fully formulated to say in response, but just in thinking about that question about the reciprocal nature of, you know, what do we what do we teach ourselves internal to the discipline, but also, you know, what does the discipline offer to other fields and so on? Um, and, and how does this work contribute on, um, you know, externally? And I just, I guess I've been thinking a lot, um, partially because of things that are happening where I work, but also, of course, because of what's happening even more so out in the world, um, with all of the conversations and debates about monuments and memorials, about the ways um, the built environment, the work that we study all the time, functions as, uh, or, or might better function, um, to tell more truthful stories about the American past. And buildings can only say so much, right? I mean, um, the building itself is, is in some respects mute, but of course to us it speaks volumes. And I guess one of the questions that I'd be interested in is thinking about how the work we do and the work that's in this particular collection might be made 
more part of a kind of public humanities conversation. You know, what does this work have to contribute to the public humanities so that um, we can help more, many, many more people understand the way race operates in and through the built environment. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of work to be done there. I'm not sure that I know exactly how that should be done, but I think it's, it's a question that really intrigues me and that I'd like to think about further and would love to hear more about from others. Yeah, maybe I'll just echo it, um, much of what Diane just said, um, is that I think the monuments debate is a really interesting uh, point, right? I think many of us have seen these wonderful um, panels and think pieces that have come out of people who aren't necessarily trained in architecture or visual culture, but have something to say, right? And so um, part of what I'm interested in in this project um, as one of the few <laughs> non-architects and architectural historians is, um, is to think about not only how race can change how we think architecture, right, but how architecture changes what we think race is, right? That you can't have an account of race without thinking about how the built environment conditions the way that we see um, and imagine what a racial encounter is, right? And so I think um, that there's, um, there's, as, there's as much work to go both ways. Um, and I think that's part of the exciting work um, of the volume. Great. On that note, um, I, I really thank everyone for this um, rich and, and really interesting conversation. And, um, you know, as we sort of, we can transition to a 10 minute break now, but I think, you know, ending on this note of thinking about um, how this academic work and thinking reverberates out into the world in a more public forum is, is a great um, note to end this first half on. Hello, everyone. We want to welcome you back to our event. Um, we're going to uh, listen to a brief message of welcome from Dean Robert Shibley from the University of Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, and then we'll proceed again with our regular program. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, the building you see behind me is our academic home here at the University of Buffalo. It sits on land once stewarded by the Iroquois Confederacy with the Seneca Nation as the keeper of the Western Door. This land was initially ceded to the King of England, then to the United States. We have to have the courage to know we live and study on a site that was taken from our six nations that preceded us. I want to use the rest of my few minutes here on the power of good questions in architecture and their ability to unpack what we think we know by exploring how we have come to know them. At the root of these observations is an affection for the epistemology and the fact that we can only know what we organize to know. As the book, Race and Modern Architecture reveals, typologies of all kinds create hierarchies and competition for attention that privilege and subjugate, that deny the very existence of race, that define the very ground on which racist cultures are built. Since I became Dean, my scholarship has demanded me to pay a lot of attention to the work of scholars on our faculty in our school, even as I try to keep up with my own academic passions. So I'll use some of that scholarship to illustrate the reach that work like has been presented here already today has. Three examples of texts published by our faculty in just the last five years illustrate well the importance and reach of deep critical history methodologies as we, is, as we have come to know still more about the potential of architecture. The, ex the examples I offer illustrate insights through the different but interrelated lenses of patronage and power and are underpinned and further revealed by the text of this launch of Race and Modern Architecture, a critical history from enlightenment to the present. The first text I'm referring to is by Professors Baum, Wang, and Prince, authored and edited as, uh, as uh, uh, the result of a symposium held here in 2012 around the subject of beyond patronage. The subtitle of the book was Reconsidering Models of Practice. The book came out in 2016, and guess what? organizing to know about the practice of architecture through the conventional lenses of patronage severely limits the potential aims of practice 
and the agencies architecture could offer the world if employed alternatives to patronage as models of practice. The text makes a persuasive case for alternative practices and offers compelling examples. A second book by Professor Despina Stratagakos offers another lens on what we value and we think we know in conventional practice. Her text on Hitler at home reveals again how the pretenses of architecture reinforce dominant cultures and uncritically invite or deny membership in such cultures. Adolf Hitler's use of design to transform perceptions of him from ruffian to statesman gives us all pause. Charles, Mabel, and Irene, and your authors now enter with a very powerful book that frames a deep critical reflection on the role of race, which is very applicable to both of the previous books I just mentioned. This book for me speaks clearly to the reality that scholarship like this is prerequisite and foundational to many other points of entry into our work. With thanks to Irene Chen and for her question and Kenny Cupper's answer, I am reminded every day of the necessity to completely rethink the aims and methods of architectural practice and its potential contribution to the evolution of anti-racist cultures all over the world. This is the right book at the right time and is indeed much larger than architecture. Thanks to all of you who made this book possible. I look forward to the remainder of this uh, book launch. Great, thank you um, Dean Shib Shibley for those wonderful um, remarks and um, we will start our third panel. So colonialist implications of possession, acts of inspection, examination, and viewing inform the concept of a survey. So we asked our third panel, quote, how considerations of, how do considerations of race affect how you teach the architectural history survey? So we'll hear from next, Reinhold Martin, Joanna Merwood Salisbury, Luis Carranza, and Ezra Acha. Hi, okay. Well, uh, hi everybody, thanks uh, first. Uh, to uh, Mabel, Irene, and Charles for bringing us together uh, in the book and indeed here on the screen. And to Diane, Abby, and everyone at the University of Pittsburgh Press for making it real. Uh, so the question, as Mabel just said, that our editors now pose to us in this panel is, how do considerations of race affect how you teach the architectural history survey? Well, uh, in my case, this as it happens is something on which I've, I've had the privilege of working closely with Mabel and learning from her, uh, uh, along with a number of other colleagues uh, for the past five years. Uh, in sum, uh, I therefore respond with one word, dialectically. For at the juncture of race and modern architecture, I think arises a whole series of contradictions, each of which connects present to past differently. So before giving, a, before giving a brief example, I just want to explain that uh, at Columbia GSEP, where, where I teach, where we teach, uh, we have abandoned uh, more or less any pretense to surveying the field's internal history uh, in our uh, Master of Architecture core, which is where the survey is taught, uh, even in the comparatively brief two centuries that we cover uh, in favor of uh, instead thematic pairings intended to serve as a framework for thinking and working historically. In each of the two semesters, one for the long 19th century and the other for the long 20th, three faculty assisted by PhD teaching fellows teach seminar style uh, off of the shared syllabus with common weekly themes and primary source readings and uh, secondary readings that vary by instructor. And by the way, we actually required everybody in the whole group, uh, all the incoming MOCs to read the intro to uh, Race and Modern Architecture this summer. As it happens, this week's theme, just this past week, was indeed race and nation. So uh, in response, my own in-class lecture this week included a detail, uh, and Lila, if we could, I guess, have the first slide, uh, a detail from Thomas Jefferson's Monticello that I discuss in the book. Uh, a section through the dining room of Jefferson's plantation villa shows the mechanical dumbwaiter that connects the room with the wine cellar below. An enslaved person supplied wine to diners 
uh, by placing a bottle in the dumbwaiter and then hoisting it from below on a system of pulleys into a compartment. Uh, if we can get a uh, little the next slide. Thanks, yeah. Uh, you can see the compartment uh, built into the side of the fireplace. This device and others effectively minimize the physical presence of enslaved persons in the room itself. But, and in a sense, this is the, the really more uh, direct response, the resulting scene uh, involves more than visibility and invisibility, silence and voice. For I think what we are calling race uh, describes two intersecting dialectics, a dialectic of dialectics, if you will. One, which we can call a dialectic of disavowal and recognition, opposes invisibilization and silencing with meaningful symbolic gestures of inclusion. The other, which we can call a dialectics of barbarism and civilization, responds to the irreducible violence uh, of racial oppression reenacted here with every pull on the dumbwaiter's rope with material redistribution and mutuality. I think it's fair to say that many critical scholars have enthusiastically embraced the first symbolic axis, the, the axis of recognition, uh, while judiciously, in many cases, avoiding the second, the axis of cooperative material repair that is systematically foreclosed by racial capitalism. But Jefferson's whiteness, uh, if we can call it that, was not merely contradictory. It wasn't just a contradiction in the kind of dialectic of enlightenment uh, in, in an intellectual sense. It was and remains barbaric in a civilizational sense. And until we learn to speak of the work of otherwise refined thinkers and artists in terms like these, uh, which I've drawn from the lexicon used by anti-capitalist dialecticians uh, like Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, and Walter Benjamin uh, to confront, in their case, another related racism, uh, we will not, in my judgment, have fully overcome what another of our teachers, W.E.B. Du Bois, called the propaganda of history. Thanks. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, wherever you are. I want to add my thanks to Mabel, Irene, and Charles, and everyone responsible for making this book happen. It's been really a great privilege to be part of this project. Uh, so my chapter in Race and Modern Architecture reconsiders a canonical 19th century architectural object, understanding it as a public projection of the dominant northern idea of American racial identity during the Civil War. Can I have the next slide, please? Specifically, uh, the chapter explores the linked ideas of racial and artistic freedom for the Northern Anti-Slavery Coalition. It begins with the sculptor Anne Whitney's Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands to God or Africa, which she exhibited at the National Academy of Design in New York in the spring of 1865. An allegorical representation of the plight of the African peoples under slavery Africa was one of the many forms of artistic production created in direct response to the national crisis of the war. From that beginning, my chapter goes on to discuss architect Peter B. White's National Academy building as a different aesthetic expression of abolitionist ideals. Without explicit reference to race, White, who is a discipline of Ruskin, relied on the symbolism of the Gothic revival to convey complementary ideals of creative and social freedom. Can I have the next slide, please? So my chapter explores the way uh, White's Academy building, especially the hand carved column capitals on the entry staircase, embodied a concept of free labor that had particular political significance for the Republican Party in 1865, uh, and not uh, coincidentally um, was uh, couched in a very um, uh, bracketed concept of what freedom meant for uh, Americans. In answer to the broader question about the architectural history survey, I think this case study opens up a discussion about the structuring presence of race in the discourse of modern architecture. And I want to suggest that race is present in this discourse, not only in the opposition between the primitive and the modern, which 
with which we're familiar, but also in the opposition between ideas of craft, which is privileged, and labor, which modern architects sought to erase in its human form. In history surveys focusing on the modern period, we need to foreground the inseparable intertwining of race and labor. And this approach begins with a discussion about the link between modernity and its global subjects, as many previous speakers have alluded to. Uh, the sociologist Anibal Kihano has argued that the creation of the conceptual category of blackness dates to the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade. He argues that the idea of a black race was constituted in tandem with new structures to control labor as part of the colonial project. So in this way, the concept of race and the modern division of labor remain structurally linked and mutually reinforcing. Any revisionist survey of modern architecture must bring this perspective to bear on the canonical literature and examples of 19th century architecture. As we know, much of this writing is taken up with a differentiation of craft and, and labor. Where labor is defined as inhumane toil, craft is described as skilled, imaginative, and self-directed. For Ruskin, Morris, and others, the privileging of craft reflected a wish to remove from labor the taint of subjection. Later in the century, the desire to control and master the machine was part of an aspiration to advance the non-laboring race categorized as white. Any survey of the various manifestations of modern architecture must place these disciplinary arguments in the context of the colonial model of global power. In this way, we must take into account not only the objects of labor, but also their subjects. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon or morning, wherever you are, I guess. Um, I again, like it goes without saying, thanks a, a lot to Irene, Charles and Mabel for not only putting the book together, but organizing this get together of all of us. Um, so um, I wanna kind of make some references that I make to my uh, essay in the, in the book that has to do with a kind of different idea and conception of race as it develops in, in the kind of Mexican um, early modern uh, example. So one of the central paradoxes of defining the principal race, racial makeup of the Mexican people is that, that, that mestizaje, the term developed to suggest its mixed racial composition, defines social characteristics more than biological traits. Can I have the next uh, slide, Lila? The term uh, mestizaje, as it, had, as it has been argued, was foundational to incorporate the, the quote-unquote Indian population into the modern state. The idea of race within mestizaje refers, broadly speaking, to the cultural and, and social characteristics of the groups that compose them, and that as historian Alan Knight notes, quote, one should properly or better describe them as ethnic, end of quote, where the identification is based on language, dress, religion, social organization, culture, and so on. Ultimately, this idea of race was social rather than based on innate biological attributes. The race of the original American Indians of Mexico was seen as a unique source for the development of architectural culture and to derive a modern national character, as Manuel Gamio would argue in Forjando Patria. Next slide, please. For me, the reconsiderations of teaching architectural history begin to acknowledge and further include works of Latino, Latina, Latinx, or Hispanic architects in Latin America and in the diaspora. This serves as a mean to question the limits of the canon, but also the self-assured position of the correctness of its narrative of exclusion, privilege, and originality. Furthermore, and for our purposes today, the challenges and opportunities of this reconsideration arise from the fact that, that race in Latin America, like in, like in the Mexican example, is a difficult category to pin down given the vastness of the territory, the complex makeup of its population, native immigrants and imported slaves, and the centrality of ethnicity as a driver and definer of culture. An approach that considers the intersections of race with, ethnic, with 
ethnicity of Latino, Latina, Latinx, and Hispanic architectural production within its diverse geographic, social, historical, and con cultural context begins to show the complex negotiations, transcultural, de- and re-territorialized, hybrid and anthropophagistic that are present within our architecture while acknowledging the discrimination and struggles that it faces to be recognized as more than an aberration or folkloric invention. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, everyone. Uh, I would also like to thank everyone who made uh, this book possible. Um, so my essay in the book is on the racialization of Muslim immigrants and refugees in Germany as it reflected on and constructed the public housing and memory debates. But to answer uh, the question of this panel, how do considerations of race affect how you teach the architectural history survey, I prepared a more general response. Next slide, please. So I understand race uh, to be a socially constructed category that produces racism based on how people look like, how they sound, or where they come from. The categorization of races and its product racism rely on the artificial typification of human bodies with essential characters attached to them by birth. Race has much less to do with the actual human bodies than the societies and than the sciences and policies that divide, classify, and label them. Races are racialized. Needless to say, to undo racism, we have to speak about race. A revised and critical global history survey is one of the productive mediums to speak about racism by exposing how modern epistemology, slavery, and colonization relied on and perpetuated categories of race that we still live with. At the same time, however, we need to study race, I think, with the anticipation that racial studies will not be needed and will disappear in the future when racism's undoing is fully accomplished. How we teach global history matters because there are many versions of it that reinforce racial categories rather than deconstruct them. For a critical understanding of racism, we need to think about abolishment activism together with new knowledge that goes beyond historians' comfort zones. We need to discard the monophonic narrative of architectural history that prioritizes sequential practices between white male architects, but that is not good enough. We also need to discard the tendency to teach history of architecture by perpetuating conventional field categories that conceive of the world and its peoples as separated into a few self-contained and often hierarchical territorial zones and races. Just like the fault lines of the clash of civilizations rhetoric mapped by Huntington on this background image. While the weakness of the Eurocentric canon is well acknowledged by now, there's still a tendency to perpetuate disciplines 19th century categories such as Islamic, Asian, or African architecture. This model segregates the world and its people into the same racial categories and is therefore too vulnerable to entrenching the same epistemological and geopolitical framework that produced racism in the first place. One of the hardest narratives to challenge in the established history is the postulation that enlightenment and modernity was a European and North American invention, which was disseminated to the rest of the world, and that the Western and Northern dominance over the world is something to be proud of. For example, the architectural history canon has obscured the global network of enlightenment revolutions and the intertwined inventions of the modern concept of people's sovereignty. It is a curious fact that many histories mention the French and the American revolutions as big leaps of humanity and benchmarks of modern self-governance, but they seldom spare a word for the global network of enlightenment revolutions and slave revolts that were happening simultaneously. It is a equally a curious fact that industrialization in Europe and colonization in Africa and Asia are discussed separately as if they were they did not reinforce each other. Next slide, please. Instead, uh, next, yes. Instead, I teach my own course as a critical and intertwined history that presents a much more connected world. This course constructs an account of the past, which acknowledges that peoples and places are affected by each other even when they seem segregated. Architectures are recipro reciprocally translated rather than disseminated from one center to the rest of the world, as if they were pur purely derivative. An intertwined history perceives each location in a given time and place in some relation to other locations and identifies whether there was a peaceful or a violent, a fair 
or an exploitative exchange, a collaborative or a competitive commission. It criticizes racism without perpetuating racial categories as the main structural dividers of the historical narrative itself. And one of the important contributions of this book, Race and Modern Architecture, I think, is the solidarity it built between American critical race and post-colonial theories, which I hope will provide more food for thought for scholars and students. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and so for panel four, um, we recognize that race and modern architecture is in no way comprehensive. Um, and that it is in fact a kind of first step as Irene suggested. And, and also I think as Ezra pointed out, that um, you know, we built this project on the on the work of of others, and and so just overall, we were always a, uh, conscious, I think, in the project that its emphasis emerges from our own Euro-American training, and also within these institutions that that we are immersed. So our next panel will consider um, what new lines of inquiry does race in modern architecture open up, and so we will hear from Adrian Brown. Peter Minosh, Andrew Hersher, and Diane Harris. Okay, um, let me just quickly say my thanks to everyone <laughs> and just echo that. Um, I think I took a slightly different approach to this. What I did was um, I basically read the book cover to cover and then just wrote a paragraph about <laughs> um, the things that were kind of overwhelming me about uh, uh, all of the pieces in aggregate. Um, and so um, this, is, this is my paragraph. Um, so um, as one of the few, as I already mentioned this, one of the few contributors to the volume who's not an architectural historian or an architect, I've been thinking about the book not only as a course correction uh, for architecture, but for those who study race and racial formation at large. So what I wanna try to describe in, in these remarks is a mode of inquiry that I think all, just about all the chapters both call for and enact. Um, and I think a lot of this is also described very nicely in the introduction, so apologize. I apologize that this is just repetition. Um, but it's this thing, um, that the effort to produce an expanded notion of what architectural thinking and theory is by researching what has typically fallen under the purview of architectural history and theory to a range of histories, philosophies, aesthetic traditions, political theories, scientific theories, and forms of governance condition conditioning its emergence. And I think it's in this act of resuturing that we can see across all of the chapters, uh, the racial work that has, often, that has often been carried out under the name of the architectural, right? So what specific racial work has uh, the architectural um, uh, enabled, um, enabled? A mode of thinking that has been such a useful instrument for racial ideology, precisely because of the field's traditional investments in figuring out representational languages and styles for the natural, the aesthetic, the universal, the modern, the clean, the efficient, the de democratic, et cetera. Terms, which is I think many of the contrib uh, contributors foreground have all historically needed racial hierarchies to function and to have weight. So that's just all to say in a, a kind of neater formulation that architecture has been an ideal discipline for laundering racial exploitation, right? It's not just that race um, has shaped architecture, right? But that architecture is doing a specific and unique work um, for reproducing um, and structuring um, racial hierarchies um, and modes of racial exploitation and formation. Um, and I think I'm gonna, this is in some ways obvious, but maybe too obvious for any of us to have really written about in detail in our pieces. Uh, but you know, there's something interesting about architecture compared to my field in English, right? Where when we're talking about race and writing, right? You're usually talking about the ways that writers are um, describing bodies, <laughs> which is one way you can, you know, explicit content, explicit racial content. Um, generally foregoing the mimetic representation of race in its physical forms, building the structures rarely evoke explicitly identifiable racial content in obvious or remarkable ways. Rather, to see race in the architectural is to see how the neutral, the universal, and the functional themselves have historically required difference to operate. I think all of the chapters give us new ways for seeing racial discourse that has strategically been made difficult to see. Um, and perhaps this is a bit too generous to say, uh, maybe, uh, but some of the architectural history and theories, slowness and historical, historical inattentiveness to race and racial formation 
I think aren't only about the field's inherent racisms and, and racial blind spots. So that is certainly a huge and important part of it. I think it's also because racial thinking has often and increasingly worked by neutralizing and naturalizing its discourse in signs in the language of the universal, the functional, and the rational. And that architecture is a particularly good partner um, in that project, right? And thinking about the ways, again, that the architectural um, does specific work um, for race. Um, okay. Um, to, to be able to see and study it, and that is, in other words, to be, to, to be able to see and study race requires scholars versed in both of these languages, the languages of spatial, the spatial language of style, use, and form, and the slipperiness of racial ideology that has gotten increasingly more efficient in masking its own logics and presences in similar abstractions. So I think it's this relationship to abstraction, right, um, and aesthetics. Um, that have often obscured the ways that race produces racial hierarchies, right, that actually make architecture and race um, <laughs> uh, uh, particularly and distinctively interesting to put in conversation with one another, right, that they have a certain investment in abstraction, right, um, that I think comes out across so many of the chapters um, that um, not only ask us to think about the ways that race makes, race informs architectural discourse, right, but again, the way that the ways that um, race requires architecture to do specific um, ideological work. So I'll stop there. Again, I'd like to, to thank you for having me at this. And it's really nice to be able to get everyone together as a group uh, at the end of this project and be able to discuss the finished work as a totality. And this is uh, just a really incredible experience for me. Uh, regarding my own chapter, uh, the first thing I'd like to claim uh, or point out is that the U.S. Capitol building, uh, the one in Washington, D.C., you probably visited it, it's the big white building with the dome. Uh, it was originally designed by William Thornton on a slaveholding sugar plantation on the island of Tortola in what is now, uh, or what was then the British West Indies. Uh, in this way, I propose that this building is perhaps the best known and one of the most important examples of Caribbean architecture. And uh, I'd like to, you know, take this claim at face value. Uh, and doing so opens up two lines of inquiry. Uh, first uh, is the creolizing of Western neoclassical architecture, or showing it to be a transnational construct configured through its relation to the wider Atlantic. And Thornton's design for the capital provides a particularly useful example. Uh, this is a geographic reframing, showing the iconic work of American architecture to be part of the discursive network that extends across the Atlantic system, and also that its concerns are not particular to the United States, but are considered within an effort to reconfigure that Atlantic world. The second line, uh, key line of inquiry for me uh, that this opens up, and along with so many others in this volume, is in the role played by slavery in the architecture of enlightenment. Um, it's well understood that the capital, uh, the Temple of Liberty, as it was called, was in fact built by enslaved people. Uh, enslaved labor literally built the edifice that presently stands in Washington, DC. We can equally say that slavery built the capital uh, in as much as the national resources, financial and material necessary for such an undertaking were appropriated from enslaved people. I focus on a third register by which slavery built the capital. The slavery configured it by being foundational to the political imaginaries in which it was formed. Uh, so, you know, obviously we're straying uh, pretty far from autonomy type and legibility when we talk about enlightenment architecture here. Uh, so a quick look at some of Thornton's uh, other endeavors offers a way that we can do all this, uh, particularly his interest in slave manumission and African colonialism. And that's what we see in the slide here. Thornton was in Tortola in order to manumit his plantations and slave people and relocate them to the settlement of Granville Town a colony of formerly enslaved people founded by Granville Sharp in Sierra Leone. Uh, Thornton never succeeded and remained a slave owner throughout his life. Uh, his goal was twofold, to expunge the constitutive crisis of slavery in American republicanism and to open up new routes for colonial extraction, basically a colonial a colonialism absent slavery, but with blacks nevertheless maintaining the Atlantic extraction regime, ultimately remaining subjects to the racial violence of global commerce. Uh, I show that the problematics of this effort continue throughout Thornton's works and are particular legible in his capital scheme. Uh, next slide, please. Which I take as another effort uh, 
to work through the problems of liberty and enslavement in a republic and to ultimately reconfigure the Atlantic world. Briefly, Thornton designed a dual elevation building. The city, the city facing east is its public elevation, including a balcony where the new presidents would be sworn in. The west elevation overlooking the National Ball, um, National Mall has a classical tholos uh, that would serve as a mausoleum for George Washington. And think here of, um, you know, Kent at Stowe Gardens or something. Uh, so you have the urban east and the pastoral west resolving perhaps the relationship between agriculture and capital within the Temple of Liberty. Uh, I propose to situate this back in the Atlantic, uh, to take it as the capital of Tortola or Sierra Leone or wherever else. Um, but the moment you do that, um, we see that it maintains the double mind that uh, found throughout Thornton's projects, that fashions racial whiteness as the universality that blacks always become subjugated to. So my final concern uh, in this building is the question of its agency. Uh, the Capitol is, as we've been discussing, one of those monumental sites where uh, blackness is supposed to be absent. Uh, inasmuch as neoclassical is architecture of Western enlightenment, that enlightenment is formed and configured through Europe's con confrontation with the non-West. In particular, its notions of sovereignty were formed through the parsing of sovereign and non-sovereign rights bearing people. And um, this, is, this is, I think, the, the proper subject that I think we can read in the Capitol uh, if we look at it through the perspective of racial blackness. Thank you. Hello. I, I, let me echo uh, thanks to uh, Mabel and Charles and Irene for organizing this book and this event. I'm, I'm very happy to have an opportunity to respond to the question of new lines of inquiry. I'm responding to this question from the University of Michigan, which is to say from a university that right now is in turmoil. There's no other word to describe it. And I couldn't help framing my response in relationship to what's happening here. I apologize in advance to the editors if the inquiry that I will point to is not the sort of inquiry that they had in mind when they posed the question that I am about to respond or perhaps not respond to. This week in Ann Arbor, we watched the administration of our university shut down through a court order, a strike by the Graduate Student Union. The union was striking, among other things, for a right to work remotely and against the deputization of the Ann Arbor Police Department as an enforcer of proper student behavior on campus. The strike had to be stopped, in the words of the president of our university, to preserve the university's excellence, including its core values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, the president's invocation of DEI in the context of an action to sue grad students back to work might seem a little strange, but it resonates all too well with other invocations of DEI policy at my university, and maybe at yours too. It also resonates with what you could think of as my university's originary inclusiveness, given that it was founded in part to educate Native youth. But in the context of our conversation today, I would specifically point to the ways in which, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, student-led calls for new anti-racist and anti-colonial curricula in schools of architecture are being folded into DEI frameworks, and sometimes even by students themselves, and in particular, uh, by white students who, it seems to me, just haven't been offered other frameworks to think through questions around race and racism. One way to think about the, uh, uh, these DEI frameworks inadequacy uh, uh, to these questions is the way that they hollow out anti-racism and hollow out anti-colonialism by quarantining discussions of race, of racism, of colonialism, of the relationships between the preceding into isolated additions to pre-existing curricula and policy, curricula and policy that I would argue are now being maintained and even advanced by homeopathic acts of diversification and inclusion. One of the most compelling lines of inquiry that I think 
our book opens up is a consideration of race as central to the discipline of architecture, which is to say that the book poses race and racism not as yet more topics to add to the architectural curriculum, but rather as bearing on all the topics of the curriculum, or even more importantly, on what counts as a curriculum itself. So among other things, I believe the book opens up inquiry into the conjoined epistemological and political adequacy or inadequacy of DEI frameworks, not only with respect to architectural history, but also to architectural pedagogy and maybe even pedagogy more generally, along with a conjoined inquiry into other frameworks that might be adequate to or even identical to anti-racism, anti-colonialism, co-liberation, co-abolition, and other urgent projects that are also as epistemological as they are political. My essay for the book began and ended with the fence that you see here on your screen. This fence was not built to advance a neighborhood's diversity or its equity or its inclusiveness. It was built to enact a foreclosure-free zone in which black homes matter. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> and I think you can just put the slide up if you would. Thank you. I wanna also um, be the final speaker to thank Mabel, Charles, Irene, and Lila and also to thank um, the really wonderful Abby Collier, who's my partner in making the uh, Culture, Politics, and Built Environment series at the University of Pittsburgh Press happen. But Abby really, to call her a partner isn't fair to her. She's really a driver. And I'm so grateful for the work that she's done to help make this series happen and to help bring this book to life and to so quickly help us get it into paperback um, when the hard copy volume sold out so quickly. So thank you, Abby. I'm really glad to be here and I'm really delighted for the success the book is enjoying so far, thanks to the fantastic contributions of my colleagues here with me today. And as I've been listening to this afternoon's remarks, I'm ever more aware that this volume pulls together a set of essays by authors who set out to look at some aspects of the built environment with honesty, truthfulness, and in some cases, the courage to correct false or deeply incomplete narratives from the past. As we continue to watch our country's precipitous slide away from democracy, and in a week that has seen a number of deeply concerning policies emerge focusing on education specifically, it seems more important than ever to consider the ways we can help as many people as possible understand all the ways race and racism operate, to continue to marshal our courage to speak out and tell the truth in and with our scholarship and the structures in and through which it works. Architecture is of course one of those structures, even if it has been poorly understood as such, both by members of the general public and by those who design it those who build it, and often those who study it. That these essays begin to correct these stories is deeply significant, and of course, this links to my earlier remarks about finding more ways to connect this work to the public humanities. So that's one line of inquiry I would love to see this volume lead to toward. Another line of inquiry, or at least a big question that hovers over this publication for me is this. Many of the authors in this volume are not people of color, including myself. So as we look for new lines of inquiry to open up, we will need to do everything we can to support future generations of black, indigenous, and brown scholars whose expertise and perspectives will shift the field in ways we've only begun to imagine, but that are essential to the generation of new knowledge, accurate perspectives, and new perspectives about the built environment. What will doing that entail? Design schools and places where architectural historians and scholars who study the built environment are trained must now reckon with this. And they must do so in a very serious, sustained way. They have to do it with their recruitment processes. They have to look at their admissions practices. They have to look at their funding strategies. They have to look at every aspect of everything they do to change the demographics of the students who study and build the built environment. This is essential, and I, I really want to emphasize here that though 
you know, it's, it's very common. I, I know this because of my work uh, at the Mellon Foundation. It's very, very common for institutions to look to outside institutions to support this work. And that just isn't going to work. Institutions have to find the ways to do this now from the inside using the resources that they have. Um, and that will be difficult perhaps, and it will be painful, but it has to happen. And if we're going to shift the ways we understand the built environment by shifting the demographics of those who produce its narratives. Moving to my own essay in this volume, as I think I, I was asked to do, I've endeavored to help readers consider um, the largely unconsidered whiteness of post-war houses, but also to consider the ways their representations were made and circulated to generate and to solidify our already wild, widely held and deeply believed notions about what we can now see as deeply destructive practices of discrimination and segregation in the US housing market. Those images like these I'm showing you here have seemed so incredibly banal and more recently as almost comical and camp that they've been easy to ignore. What I've tried to demonstrate is that we ignore them and the vast visual field of representations like them at our peril. I'm nearly at the end of my allotted four minutes, so I'll conclude simply by saying this. I'm delighted for the success of this volume, but I believe it must be considered as a long overdue opening salvo for a set of fields that has a great deal of work to do. Let this be the first of many important books that will help us finally see the built environment as it truly is in all of its uplifting and inspiring beauty as we've been wont to look at it and with all of its telling, scarring cruelties of exclusion and oppression and harm. Now is the time to face the past unflinchingly, and we need every scholar from every field to help us do so. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for those really excellent um, final two pa uh, panels. And we're starting to get um, uh, questions in our Q&A. So those um, of you who are out there who have questions, please feel free um, to list them in the Q&A. I guess we'll just start um, and maybe continue along the lines of what we were discussing, I think, in the, the, the first two, two panels. But I mean, I thought, you know, sort of maybe connecting um, Adrian's comments to Andrew's comments to, uh, to sort of also what Reinhold started out with. Um, seemingly, and, and, you know, we're all operating in these kinds of institutional contexts. Um, that are in fact global, right? We're all at things called universities, the same thing that Andrew, I think, brought out. Um, and so the logics, the necessity, the commonsensical of these universities, right? These are the things that places are aspiring to, to establish. But also the same could be said for what it represents, the universal, and I know Reinhold, you've been doing a lot of work actually on, on universities, right, for your, for your next book. But also that architecture is also in that. And I think Adrian's point is that architecture in particular because of its representational strategy and i've always thought that architecture hasn't been interrogated because it kind of, it is an implied art it's pragmatic it just is um and so it's very sneaky <laughs> in that regard in terms of of how its racialization right is is working and i think peter you also sort of bring out you know that here's thornton and you know he's a plantation owner and so he aspires to become an architect in order to both lift his status and also to operate right within this kind of transatlantic context. It is the perfect subjectivity to, in fact, move through right these these circuits of both capitalism, race, racial capitalism, emerging nationalism, um, and so um, you know racial difference is operative in all of these. Right, I, I think is what what Adrian Brown. Bought out, and so with the book, kind of maybe just as a a stepping off point, what other sorts of work projects um, should we be undertaking? Like Diane saying, public history, but are there there are other ways in which um, this work could be engaged? Right, you know, there was the question of curriculum, for example, um, and what that means. So, um, and I and I think we have a diverse audience, and and maybe we could also talk about practice because we are and many of us training training practitioners. Sure, I'll give it a try. Um, maybe um, starting with, with the survey and the pedagogy, um, but um, ending with um, 
the politics that we all um, attend to or should attend to in our institutions. I'm wondering what the um, what the learning objectives of the survey should be in in this historical conjuncture. Um, as Reinhold suggested, um, so abolishing the survey or at least uh, replacing it with the thematic um, curriculum and Ezra's quite different approach for a more connected, less racist categorization or less filled with racist categorizations, etc. These are these are already very different proposals. Um, in my context, I teach outside of architecture. I always have to make an argument both for architecture and for history. Um, so we, we really start with the present. Um, and for instance, with you know, COVID-19 uh, as a particularly um, productive, intimate global moment um, of, um, of thinking um, of how lives have changed and how um, this uh, exacerbates uh, racial and, and economic inequalities. And so from there, um, uh, then going back to historical inheritances and colonial afterlives. Um, so, you know, to, I, five years ago, I would have said, well, starting from the present, that's, you know, why would you do that? Um, but I see now no other way to make this uh, material relevant. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the the learning aims of the survey and the methods of pedagogy. All right, I'll, I'll answer to some extent. I will try, but I, I, I have to say I will do so, I'll try to do so more on my own behalf rather than on the behalf of my colleagues we because we really do work together as a group and they will you know kind of attest to this and they've actually been very interesting you know a lot of different people have been involved in our effort at least because we've had guests visitors also um, as participants in this and I, you know so Kenny my answer to you um, and which is a is, is a is a is addressed to like you know the practicing architecture student you know the students being trained as architects as well as scholars is to learn to think historically and to work historically. And not to, you know, kind of know, memorize names and dates and lineages and what came before what. Of course, that, that kind of knowledge is uh, wherever it's located in the world and in, in, in terms of whatever dynamics and conflicts that, that it materializes is going to be necessary as a kind of framework or an armature on which to hang something like historical thinking. But, but, you know, so for example, one of the kind of persistent, persistent conversations that, that we've had as a group, um, you know, that probably speaks to your question too, is, you know, the question of how to narrate the, the interplay of continuity and change. This came up, I mean, I think Ezra was asking about that, even with respect to historiography at the beginning. So why? Because I think, and certainly with respect to, uh, any effort to to cultivate uh, uh, an anti anti racist um, imagination uh, amongst ourselves and our students, our colleagues, uh, you have one. We have to be able to cultivate and, and demonstrate the, the the simple historical fact that things change. They can be made to change. So so that you know, of course, again in architecture, change is slow. It, you know, all this kind of thing, but. But it does seem to me that uh, this, this you know, tension that is very conventional historiographical problem of, of continuity and change. Uh, this is why I mentioned uh, dialectical thinking because that you know, rather notoriously uh, raises these kind of questions, that kind of paradigm in, in particular ways. Um, but of course, that's, that, that as, again, is my own response to a kind of shared problem, I suppose, uh, we could say. Yeah, maybe I can comment on Kenny's question about how does the present moment uh, change um, the uh, objectives or the way we teach. And I think that the present moment actually uh, exposes how important <laughs> the issues of race uh, are. I mean, we all uh, notice uh, the disproportionate uh, impact of COVID-19. And I mean, there's a very disproportionate death of uh, African-Americans. And the necropolitics of the state was exposed. The state decided who is going to live and who is going to die. And in that 
since uh, the immigrants uh, who are considered illegal uh, became the essential farm, I mean, the farm workers who brought uh, us food while we were quarantining, who uh, made the continuity of the uh, food supply chain was not broken. Uh, they were also uh, immigrants that were considered from the state's uh, viewpoint, uh, disposable, uh, deportable. So we saw that the immigrants are both essential and deportable in, this, uh, in the state's eyes. I mean, we uh, saw how the prison industrial complex is uh, exposed. I mean, the prisoners uh, were brought in to put uh, the California fires um, out. Um, and when they are not needed, they're <laughs> um, returned back to the det detention centers, which is uh, part of uh, the capitalist uh, incarceration system and so on. So I think many of the things that have been happening in the present due to the COVID-19 and other um, events are uh, to me exposing the importance of these studies and the relevance uh, of these studies. Thank you. Yeah, I would say the present moment very briefly. Could you say that we don't have the luxury anymore of teaching the survey? No, I, mean, I don't think teaching the survey is luxurious at all. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you, you know, start from racial capitalism and think about, you know, the, the prison industrial complex back to the, the slave ship? That would be another way to think about the global history. Yeah, but maybe um, what we understand uh, of survey is very different because, I mean, what I was proposing was precisely to make these um, relevant topics be part of this, um, whatever I mean, I don't like to call it the survey, it's the introductory course. Um, so I think, um, and I, I still think we need to continue to think as world citizens uh, and to teach as world citizens. So um, in that sense, a understanding of the globe and the um, you know, global racial justice and so on are important uh, topics to, to teach. So I don't think this, what you call the survey or what I call the introductory course uh, in a revised way is um, irrelevant at all, quite the contrary. Can I um, okay. jump in also a little bit? Um, I, I really agree uh, with the, the proposal that the present moment is a great way to introduce students to historical thinking. Um, something that's been very much to the forefront of my mind uh, recently is um, a sort of um, re-exoticizing or re-primitivizing of Maori culture in New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand, in the present moment, um, where in the moment where we are in crisis um, climatically and uh, in, t in terms of public health, there is a strong urge to um, reclaim what is known as Mataranga Maori, uh, Maori knowledge, um, as being a more natural relationship with the earth and its resources and something that we can learn from. This is a very strong dialogue in Aotearoa right now. Um, that's a really interesting conversation to start with um, because it uh, problematizes race uh, in a way that is quite obvious to people, I think, who have historical training, but uh, has to be explained a lot to students. Um, so uh, as an entry point to questions of how race has structured global relations, I think that's a, an interesting moment. Yeah, I, I, to maybe re respond to that just a little bit, um, in the um, questions of architectural history that Reinhold and I are, are both teaching, um, we do start actually with a discussion of Rousseau and Loger, um, you know, to say to, ha you know, how much of the investment both in a description of a political world, a society, you know, a description of nature that, you know, that Rousseau invests in, particularly in relation to creating the category of the primitive, right, um, that one can return to, um, or certainly the white, the white West could return to, but also, you know, paralleling Loger, right, imagining this sort of primitive hut exactly uh, at that same moment. 
Um, and then to kind of move on to someone like Goethe and Jefferson, who we look at the next day, and Latrobe, to see how this plays out in a colonial context. And so um, to talk about you know, the relationship between then race and nation, right, as invested in the production of these representations, but also these ideo ideologies of nation uh, and society, right, that, that then are doing, I think what Ezra said um, really brilliantly um, when you described it, that the racial categories do work as historical dividers, right? And so within our own work of teaching history, there's a work that race is, is doing within that. But maybe to take this to the current, we have a question from David Musa, um, who asks, how is the historical erasure of non-white architectural history played a role in producing the present moment of unrest and racial disquiet in the US? For example, what role has architecture played in the production of systems, policing, imprisonment, the legal process, American capitalism, gentrification, et cetera, that are currently being questioned by Black Lives Matter for their clear white supremacist foundation in America. How can exploring non-white architecture be relevant, uh, uh, as relevant to this change? I'll jump in here because I think um, I was really interested in this question um, as how it relates, for how it relates to the discussion that we were having previously about the survey. Um, and, I was thinking about how the way that I teach about race and architecture has um, has shifted over time. I think um, it's gained more urgency um, so that maybe previously if I could sort of um, kind of talk with students about how race informed you know the development of modern architecture and kind of played out from the eighteenth century to the present in a more um, at a, a sort of distanced way, or I, I didn't always feel the demand to kind of connect it as urgently with the present. And I would say that's changed um, for me in the last six months where um, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I guess it, it goes back to this question of like how instrumental um, do we think historical research and teaching can and should be, and maybe also to kind of return to some of the provocations that Andrew um, presented, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening now and how do we sort of really make that direct line between what we're presenting in class and maybe how we think students should be operating as citizens and activists in the present. So I feel much more urgency to sort of connect the historical thinking to activism. Um, I mean, I, mean I, I, I think what Irene, your comment also connects um, to, to uh, I think it was David's question, insofar as um, what, what the question referred to as, say, mass incarceration or gentrification or segregation can also be understood as the latest iterations of settler colonialism and racial capitalism. That is to say, the present is not just the present, it's also enmeshed it, 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 it in um, a past who, whose dynamics continue to today. Um, what I wonder about is uh, the, the word activism in, in, in relationship to um, scholarship and pedagogy, I'm, 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 I'm provoked by it in a way because it, it, I'm provoked by the, I think the, the, the kind of separation between uh, 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 the world of the institution and the world outside the institution that, that it seems to presume. Our universities are in the world and, and, and um, what's going on in the world is also going on in our universities, even if it's disavowed or, or repressed. And, and so, I'm not disagreeing with you, Irene. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that when we do what we do as scholars or when we do what we do as teachers, I think we also have a possibility to do what we do as activists, if that makes any sense. So that, so that, 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 that maybe act, we don't have to think about activism as, as an add-on um, to um, 
pedagogical or 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 or, or scholarly work. Um, oh, does someone else want to help? Go, uh, ahead, go ahead. Well, very briefly, um, going back to the, the question about the, the teaching of, of non-white architectures as a way of responding to the, the present moment, it also seems to me that this could include things outside the box. Um, and thinking about Reinhold's comments about how teaching history is also teaching uh, the possibility that things could be different and that you in looking, unpacking a historical moment, you're also unpacking like it, it happened this way, but you know, there were other people who wanted it to happen this way and that could help us imagine our present moment differently. And, and it reminds me of another text that we teach at Pratt in the history survey, which is Charles's essay on uh, June Jordan and um, the, the fictional account of a, a 1970s black teenager who creates an alternative utopian or semi-utopian environment or several such, such environments. Um, and, and what it does to kind of open up uh, these other, these non-white imaginaries of, of architecture and of what the city could be and what politics could be and uh, what would it look like if we used all the empty office space as housing, a, a question that's raised in that fiction, which seems particularly relevant in a moment of uh, so much empty office space. Um, so I think, you know, there might be something to uh, picking up those kind of threads, picking up these roads not taken, the, these imaginaries, um, you know, as, as something that goes in the survey, that, that goes in uh, the, the kind of what, what, the, what we teach or what one of the most important things that we teach is, is that. And, and that would be good. Um, so I actually had some thoughts uh, related to some of the questions that have been scrolling through the chat um, and that intersect with what we've been discussing. Um, Anna Maria's question about, um, you know, how you've changed your teaching now. Um, and, and, and Brian's question about even the title. So as, as not an editor of this thing, I, I have a, I would add nonetheless to, to your list of possible alternative subtitles, racial capitalism and modern architecture. Um, and, and I'm saying that be, partly because it's an answer to Anna Maria's question that I just happened, it happened that I also taught this week um, Cedric Robinson's uh, chapter, the book from Black Marxism on racial capitalism, which is a master narrative in a certain way. It's not, you know, it, or we could call it a kind of survey. It's, it's not, this is, so in terms of like pedagogical method, uh, even though, uh, you know, as we were discussing, uh, we in our practice, our teaching practice, have tried to displace the kind of big stories uh, in the way we're teaching the survey. Uh, I, I frequently return myself in various contexts to the, to the necessity to be able, and this is go back to the, th the idea of things can change, uh, to, to be able to narrate historical change at the scale, you know, uh, at, that a survey typically would. Um, you know, we, we really can't forget, I, we shouldn't forget that our old friend uh, Leotard, who gave us the critique of the master narrative, was a co-editor of, so, of the journal Socialism or Barbarism. Uh, he was not a, a postmodernist in, in the sense that, you know, ha, ha, has become uh, associated with the, the sort of particularization uh, of narratives. So this tension between like what is happening here and here and here, or what happened here and here and here, and what is happening, or what could be happening in, in deeper time and broader space uh, is, is of course, a, you know, a classic problem for historians. And Robinson, anyway, deals with this in a very interesting way that I think goes back to what Ezra was raising about immigration, because his basically methodological point in that chapter, is, this is actually, most of it is about Europe. And as most of it is about early modern Europe, even medieval Europe. Uh, and ra you know, in, in, in which race is a kind of precondition for, for racial, racial thinking, race thinking uh, is a precondition for the rise of emergence of the bourgeoisie. So rather than the kind of idea that bourgeois be bourgeoisie becomes a universal class that assimilates you know, capitalists over the world, it's, it's, he turns that on its head. Uh, and he therefore says the history of Europe is the history of immigration, uh, but specifically, um, the, the calling up of reserve armies, which later would become Marx's reserve army of, of labor. But in, in the beginning, in a sense, in his story, it's actually a reserve army, it's mercenaries. 
uh, who are like Polish or, or, or from the Slavic lands or whatever in France. Uh, because they're, you know, it, it's in a, in a way it's easier to pay them to, to fight, you know, for the nation than this new idea in the nation than to pay the French peasants because they're a little skeptical. So um, anyway, that, that's a big story. That's a, you know, it's in fact, uh, Robinson himself comes out of uh, via, uh, he comes out of uh, uh, Binghamton in part uh, and, and world systems theory and Emmanuel Wallerstein is all over the footnotes of this hypothesis regarding racial capitalism. So it does seem to me that, that you know, I, I'm not also thinking about how, um, uh, you know, the question that Manuel asked about, and others, the, it came up in other discussion about kind of so-called interdisciplinary, you know, exchange and dialogue. Um, you know, for those of us who, who, you know, emphatically believe that the history of modern architecture is in one way or the other, a history, not exclusively, but, but in, in, in irreducible ways, uh, of the relationship between, let's say, something like culture and capitalism, then, then this vocabulary allows us a, and set of concepts and, and counter histories. In the case of, of, of Robinson, it's a counter history. He's, he's ultimately telling the, the longer story of the emergence of, of a radical black tradition in the figure of Du Bois, C.L.R. James, and Richard Wright. Um, but but that, whole, that whole project gives us a, a, a new toolkit, a new, a new set of tools that we can kind of then in a way maybe even compare or at least uh, put into, into relation with uh, existing uh, critiques of uh, capitalist development and so on related to colonialism and, and, and even metropolitan, uh, you know, classic metropolitan capitalism. So anyway, that, that's, that's just it's sort of a little bit of an effort to kind of connect a, a few of the dots uh, in, in the, the conversation, and I, I don't know if it's uh, of interest, but I appreciate the question. Yeah, maybe I can also uh, answer the question about how is the present moment changing the conversation uh, in the class. Uh, that's how I read the question. Uh, and uh, just yesterday, uh, I uh, taught uh, Foucault, Angela Davis, and George Chamayu together. I mean, the discipline and punish um, our prisons obsolete and the theory of the drone. Um, and I think in the context of the defund the police and uh, movement and so on, I think the conversation, I mean, the students uh, are not only talking about uh, the surveillance um, of the social media and so on and so forth, but they are seeing the surveillance capitalism uh, within the context of the mass incarceration and the defund the police movement. I think, um, I mean, I am finding, um, again, these texts, uh, as um, providing uh, really um, useful or meaningful conceptual tools for the present moment. Uh, so in that sense, I think the present moment is um, proving um, that it is there is an opportunity actually to uh, make these texts much more um, transformative rather than things that we just discuss in class and then you know, do not see any um, transformation in daily life. Yeah, no, I, I think these are, are excellent points. And I think to Brian Norwood's what's question about should should it be race, racialization, racism, I actually like Alex Wahaley's notion of racial assemblage, um, that race does work across a um, huge, you know, kind of um, structures, social structures. So it's ideological, it's infrastructural, it's linguistic, it's representational, it's, you know, and so it's operative. So, so you know, it's not, it's not just race, but we have to think of its relationship to racism and, and, and other things. But there's a really great question by Aaron Smithson um, in the Q&A. It says, for those of you, and I think this is many of us, who, um, who train practitioners, whether you teach practice or not, how do you address the inherent power dynamics that are present in most forms of architectural production? What do you say to students whose professional opportunities are often limited to spaces and practices still shaped by violent regimes of white supremacy, like private property, et cetera? Should we be looking for a way out? And how do we find it? Which I think is a really, and this will be the last question but I think it's a really great one to end on. Andrea. Well, as an as a, as a architectural historian who primarily teaches in a school of architecture, I, I find myself often saying to students, I, I don't want to teach you to do better 
projects in studio, I want to teach you to desire better projects in studio. I, I'm not sure if that's, I'm not sure if that actually makes sense to them in the way that I hope it does, but I, I, I think it, it, it comes from the same place that the, the question came from, which is that in, in, in training students to become uh, architects, we are training them to situate themselves in the world as it is and to, and to um, accept as normative or even, even, or even to um, render invisible um, things that that are, are received versions of architecture cannot change or must uh, uh, must um, base itself on. So if 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 a if a if a historian can if a history class can somehow um, 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 uh, make studio inadequate to the kind of world that students want to live in and. And, and architect in, then um, I think that that would be um, a positive consequence. Can I just add something there? I, that's really important, but it is incredibly difficult. Um, just a small anecdote from my own experience, uh, having a recent master's student who was uh, making a project with a very strong feminist um, bent behind it, um, who ended up nearly failing because she refused to create a building so i was in the simultaneous position of totally supporting her project but trying to um, argue to my colleagues that it mattered and it counted and she deserved to at least uh, get a grade to pass yeah, i'd like to address that a bit as well, but from a slightly different perspective. So um, when I have students, and particularly when I have students of color who look at um, architectural history and they're looking for themselves and their experiences and their backgrounds and their cultural expertise, and they don't find it. And when they don't find it there, they, they some of them uh, sort of throw up their hands in despair and try to a hack or dismantle things that exist in the canon as it is. While others say that, you know, I should be there. So let's revise what this is. Let's create the kind of space where the kind of expertise that I have matters here in this space. And that's the, the purpose and function of their architectural education, to engage with a kind of critical discourse that does not have the critical vocabulary to understand their background and their experiences, and to be doing work that contributes to the revision of that space. And so I think that there are probably a lot of professional architecture students who feel that way and who have that experience. And at least from my perspective, using the uh, framing of race and modern architecture acknowledges these other spaces, these other modernities as something that is legitimate that can be historicized, that needs to be historicized so that we can understand what it is that the architect does. And so for, from, uh, at least with those students that I'm working with who tend to be students of color and who wanna write themselves into that history, one of the first things they have to do is to challenge what architecture means, who invented that term and who does it serve? And to acknowledge its politics and to be forthright about that. And, and for me, what's so productive about this volume is that it puts all of that front and center. It's not a formalist game. It's not an intellectual game only. It's something that has to do with power and the way that architecture and architectural knowledge legitimizes those forms of power. And so um, what I like is when we think about architecture and we think about the built environment, and we think about it in relationship to race, and we understand that both of those terms are heavily politicized and heavily anchored in certain ways in certain contexts, but that they, if we only tell the story from the position of the elites and from those who get to define those histories, then we're losing out on quite a bit of the other story. Uh, and what I like about the, the whole conversation that we've been having 
this whole day, but particularly between the essays, I think, uh, is those spaces of new types of narratives that can start to emerge. That's when I feel most uh, optimistic about what our field can produce. Uh, and um, not sort of relying on the old kinds of uh, either the European concepts of modernity and what they say is important or how that structures one's knowledge or understanding, but to understand that different communities produce different relationships to modernity. They bring different needs and, and demands, and they produce different knowledges of space. And if we have a field that acknowledges that, I think maybe we won't be having the same conversation that we're having now 20 years from now. It will be very different because there will be different types of expertise acknowledged and different types of architectural producers at the table. Uh, for me, that's what I'm hoping uh, is uh, explicit in this volume. That's the kind of productivity that, that I like to see both in the professional space, but also among scholars who do architectural history. I can't imagine a better way to sort of close out our discussion. So thank you so much, Charles, for those comments and thoughts. And I think um, imagining the discipline in 20 years and how it will hopefully be different as a result um, in part of some of the conversations and work that um, you all um, have begun, I think is, is pretty exciting. And also to project to the different kind of world that we might inhabit because of the different kinds of scholarship and teaching um, that we're all engaged in um, is pretty exciting. So thank you so much, um, everyone. And um, we're going to conclude if, if we can pull up the slides. Oh, actually, um, it's in the chat. Um, wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, first, we mentioned that there's a new website that we've created that we'll, we're hoping to populate with um, additional resources and um, um, so we've posted the link there, raceandmodernarchitecture.com. Um, additionally, um, thank you to everyone who attended the event today. Um, if anyone hasn't purchased a book and is interested in doing so, the University of Pittsburgh Press is offering a discount um, using this code. Um, and this is only available through University of Pittsburgh, um, their website. Um, so if you use this code, RAMA30, that's good till October 31st, that will um, give you a 30% discount off the list price. Um, so with that, I want to introduce um, the Dean of CCA, Keith Clemwoody, who will offer some closing thoughts. Am I live, Irene? Yes. Hi, thanks, Irene. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, Mabel and Charles, and all of the contributors for sharing this book and these histories and ideas with us this afternoon. I'd also like to thank all of those at GSAP, Buffalo, and CCA who organized and facilitated this afternoon's proceedings. And finally, I'd like to thank Dean Andreas and Dean Shipley for partnering with us here at CCA on this important event. I want to acknowledge that CCA campuses are located in Huichen and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of the Chochineo and Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial, we recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and in the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you're joining us virtually today. This year at CCA, we're exploring the theme of remaking, both in our curriculum and in our public programs as a means through which to collectively address the urgency of this moment and to acknowledge the work we must do together as, com as a community of learners and teachers to reconsider and remake not only architectural education, but also the disciplines of architectural history and design. Our work as architects and designers is always an extension of that which came before, knowingly or not. If knowingly, it can only be an extension of that which we know, either with great confidence and certainty or obliquely as a hunch or as a myth. Unknowingly, our work extends without intention those systems and relations of power that exert themselves in our lives and the lives of all others, holding us in a web of forces from which we can never fully extract ourselves. It's possible, however, to seek to understand them better, to be more aware, to know more, and to know otherwise. 
In any discipline, what we call the canon constructs a shared body of known ideas, matters, and forms. It necessarily then also hides a body of knowledge and keeps us from it. With more knowledge, including knowledge outside and beyond the canon, we would be able to more knowingly extend the world to make it more open, more equitable, and to include in our visions for the future space for those unlike ourselves, and therefore make room for our future selves, who, if we're successful, may likely be strangers to our current selves. There's no doubt in my mind that this book, Race and Modern Architecture, will be a key document in remaking the ways in which we understand and perform architectural history, but also in the ways in which we imagine and build a future as we practice our architecture. As we all, architectural historians and architects, students and teachers, respond to the challenges of COVID-19 and the urgent call to action of the ongoing calls for racial justice and equity, we must commit ourselves to the idea that architecture can and should serve the common good. Architecture is a product of the ideologies of those who conceive it and for whom it is built. Throughout history, architects and designers have been bound in service to the privileged and the powerful. As such, architecture has often been a tool of oppression rather than one of liberation. It's long past time that we reconsider who and what interests we serve. With this in mind, we must commit ourselves, as these editors and authors have, to the project of reconsidering and remaking architectural education and architecture itself, to acknowledge the biases and inequities of our histories and methods, and to consciously cultivate inclusive and anti-racist design pedagogies and practices. Thank you again to the editors, contributors, and organizers, and to all of you for joining us this afternoon for this important discussion. Have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you so much, Keith. And we just want to thank all of the participants and a special thank you to Lada Catelier and uh, GSAP AV for keeping us moving. Um, so again, thank you all for, for coming um, to the book launch of Race and Modern Architecture. Do take care. <laughs>